Airline Pilot Guy, episode 107, is brought to you by Audible.com. Get your free audiobook download and 30-day free trial by going to audibletrial.com slash airlinepilotguy. Over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Airline Pilot Guy, episode 107. listening to the Airline Pilot Guy Show, the view from my side of the cockpit door. I'm Captain Jeff, your host, broadcasting live from Studio B5, actually Gate B5, at the Sarasota Bradenton International Airport in Florida. In this episode, we're going to talk about Ryanair is going to fly to the United States for $14, Asiana Airlines fine. Uh, let's see... A woman, 19 years old, arrested for pointing a laser at a police helicopter and one passenger's not-so-nice letter to a female captain. This and more feedback, so get all settled in. Tray tables and seat backs in their upright and locked positions, electronic devices powered on. Flight 107 is ready for a pushback. Okay, well this is a first. A little bit uh, unusual and uh, I feel a little odd doing this, but... Um, I meant to get out a podcast earlier in the week. I had a four-day trip, and it just uh, nothing worked as planned last week. And uh, so I thought, well, okay, I'll just do it when I get home. I got home on Friday. Was that right? No. I got home on Wednesday. And then uh, on Thursday, I got assigned this trip that I'm on right now, uh, and it's currently a Friday. So I did a two-day, a four-day, followed by a two-day. This trip, though, um, fortunately for me, is a uh, overtime flying trip. So I thought, well, I have a little bit of time here. We just missed the flight back to Atlanta uh, that uh, we had only like a couple minutes overlap uh, coming in from New York to uh, Sarasota here, and there was a 7-5 heading to Atlanta, and they were basically pushing back when we arrived. So we have to wait just under three hours, um, and right now it's more like two hours to go before our flight to Atlanta. So I thought, hey, I'll go ahead and at least knock out uh, maybe the first hour of the show while I'm here at the airport in Sarasota. And uh, fortunately, the, uh, the terminal's not too busy, uh, just a very few passengers here and there. And so uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, do this without too many distractions. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the trip that I was on uh, Sunday through Wednesday uh, was another one of those doozies of a trip. Uh, first day was, uh, uh, let's see, where did we go first? We went up, oh, we deadheaded to Albany, New York, and then flew back, flew the airplane back to Atlanta. And then we flew late Sunday night to uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And right about the time that that uh, wintry uh, storm went through Memphis, and in fact, uh, when we were uh, making our approach, they were calling for heavy thunderstorms, and uh, it wasn't really that bad. A little bit of lightning here and there. Uh, it, the airport was calling heavy thunderstorms, but it was really more like um, moderate rain showers. Uh, broke out at about 600 feet and uh, landed with no problem. Uh, runway wasn't slippery or anything. So we got uh, in the hotel van, and we noticed when the hotel van pulled up, it was covered with snow, and so. Uh, the frontal system was just making its transition between rain on the warm side to wintry precipitation on the on the other side, the cold side. Uh, the trip from the airport to the hotel was quite interesting. A lot of uh, ice and slush on the road. Uh, the driver did a jo good job. He's uh, originally from Brooklyn, so he had a little experience uh, driving in that kind of weather. And uh, we got to the hotel, and it was late. Oh, by the way, on that flight... Um, Let's see, um, trying to remember, gosh darn it, Andy, Andy Boyer um, was on my jump seat from Atlanta to Memphis, and uh, he actually, uh, we were sitting there, and I don't know if we were taxiing out or if we had already taken off, but at some point he says to me, or maybe it was before we even backed out from the gate, he said, um, do you have a podcast? <laughs> I said, yeah, why? And that kind of blew my co-pilot away because uh, I'd just spent 
most of the flight down from Albany to Atlanta explaining to him what a podcast was and what I did and all that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden this guy's on the jump seat and uh, he's going, are you Captain Jeff? So uh, Andy uh, uh, rode with us to Memphis. He's a pilot for Seaport Airlines. And uh, he was flying to Memphis to cover a trip uh, the next day. And he wanted to go with us uh, downtown to um, our hotel to talk aviation and really kind of pick um, uh, my co-pilot's brain because uh, he had just you know gone through the, the whole regional airline route and uh, he thought maybe he could pick up some good tips from him. Uh, unfortunately, and it's a good thing, I think, Andy, if you're listening, that you didn't try to drive downtown because the roads were just a mess and uh, and the bar was closed and it was just not not a good time to uh, to hang out um, in Memphis so got back to the hotel got to bed next day we were scheduled to uh, leave around two o'clock in the afternoon uh, looked out the window in the morning everything's covered with ice and snow and I'm thinking hmm I wouldn't be surprised if our flight to Minneapolis was canceled but it wasn't they uh, Got us to the uh, airport in one piece. Again, it was kind of a slick, slippery ride to the uh, airport. But the, the airport, for some reason, was in much better shape uh, than the downtown Memphis area. Uh, launched from uh, Memphis to Minneapolis en route. What we were supposed to do that day was go to Minneapolis and then head over to Denver with a short layover near the uh, Denver airport. And we... We're en route to Minneapolis, got a message on the ACAR system that said that we were going to be rerouted, or rerouted, whichever you prefer. And it said, when you get to Denver, now you're going to continue to fly, and you're going to go from Denver to New York, LaGuardia, and you're going to get in after midnight. And both of us were looking at each other like, really? I mean, we were so looking forward. We were already kind of tired from that. Uh, nasty weather day the day before and now we have to uh, uh, we have to continue flying and we're going to be tired and it's going to be late but uh, turns out that I'm glad we did it because the uh, the flight was um, from earlier in the day it was supposed to be an Airbus uh, 320 and it had, uh, had a problem with the cargo doors and, or one of the cargo doors and they thought they were going to be able to fix it and take everybody to New York and then that really didn't fix the problem and it turns out that they had some kind of a hydraulic issue, hydraulic leak that had been leaking for several days unnoticed uh, and undiscovered. So they had to bring in a mechanic from Minneapolis. In fact, we probably brought the mechanic in, although nobody said anything to us about it to work on the thing so that the airplane wasn't going to be ready until the next day but they had all these passengers that wanted to go to New York and they've been there for hours and so the one of the gate agents there thought well there's a MD-90 coming in from Minneapolis and if these guys have, still have crew, crew duty left in their day uh, maybe they could take well not maybe uh, perhaps Acme could you know fly the flight from Denver to LaGuardia on the 90 and then have somebody fly back uh, in the middle of the night to Denver so it'll be ready the next day to uh, fly its normally scheduled flights and so when I learned about that I thought you know well I'm tired I'd rather be laying over in Denver not that I had a choice about it uh, and so we you know we, we felt better about flying for over three hours from Denver to uh, New York got getting into New York as I mentioned after midnight uh, luckily the weather was nice in New York it was nice and clear and uh, flew the uh, uh, expressway visual runway 31 and uh, I was a little you know it was it was uh, an interesting approach let me say um, not not 100% at that point little little groggy not a groggy but uh, just not 100% uh, but we got the airplane on the ground without a problem nice landing got to the gate everybody was happy for the most part you know they weren't happy that they were there seven hours after they were supposed to be but at least they finally got to their destination so we look to see what hotel we're going to be lodging in, and it says we're going to the Grand Hyatt. Now, the Grand Hyatt is not one of the normal hotels that we stay in at Acme. Called up crew accommodations, and they said, yeah, all our contracted hotels are booked. So we have to send you downtown. And I said, well, we only have like 10 hours. And they said, I know, but that's the only, the only place we can find. So we took our transportation, contracted transportation company downtown, got to the Grand Hyatt Hotel, beautiful hotel by the way, right 
either on top of or right next to Grand Central Terminal in uh, downtown New York City. Not downtown, midtown, whatever that is, whatever that area is. Uh, just off of uh, 42nd, 43rd, that, that area. And uh, so we walked in, and the guy at the front desk goes, oh, Nope, don't have anything for you. No rooms. And we went, huh? So we spent the next hour or so on the phone with our company trying to figure out uh, you know, who dropped the ball and why don't we have any rooms. And uh, there was a little bit of mix-up about that, but finally they got that straightened out, and we were finally <laughs> in our rooms. I think the door closed um, a little after 2 o'clock in the morning. Very tired, uh, needless to say. Again, very nice hotel. I wish I'd had more time to spend there. So the next day, instead of flying from Denver to Atlanta to Charlotte, we ended up uh, deadheading uh, later in the day than we had anticipated. That was the day I was going to record this show, 107. Uh, but it didn't work out. By the time I get in, got into Charlotte, by the way, they screwed up the uh, transportation details on that one as well. I had to pay for a cab uh, out of pocket. Hopefully I'll get reimbursed for that. And uh, we um, got into Charlotte around 4 o'clock-ish, 4, 4.30, something like that. Now, I will say that the highlight of my trip was uh, my meetup with uh, Stephanie, one of the listeners. Uh, and she picked me up, and she is an expert on... Um, well, first of all, let me tell you about... Uh, first of all, I should say... Uh, Stephanie is a doctor of osteopathy. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, so she's a doctor and she is a private instrument rated pilot, but she's working on a commercial license and that's why you know she listens to uh, the show and contributes to it. Um, so the reason why, and those are all really, really great things and very impressive, you know, doctor of osteopathy and... Um, and a private pilot instrument rated, working on a commercial license, all that stuff. But the, the most impressive thing is her knowledge of beer. <laughs> she is definitely a beer lover, craft beer um, enthusiast. And so she said, let me um, treat you or show you what North Carolina has to offer as far as IPAs are concerned. So I went, deal. So she picked me up and we went to a place called Duckworth's. Uh, tavern and tap or grill and tap or something like that anyway great place great selection of beers uh, had several very very nice North Carolina IPAs and uh, so we had a great time talked about aviation and beers and life in general so um, had a great time uh, with Stephanie thanks Stephanie if you're listening um, hope to do it again sometime soon because we only just put a little tiny dent in the uh, list of great craft brews in North Carolina. So, let's see. Finally got home on Wednesday night, and then I talked to you about uh, the next day, Thursday. I was uh, just about, I had everything set up actually, and was just finalizing some of my notes, and got a call from Acme Scheduling and saying, hey, if you want um, some overtime flying, we have a two-day trip for you. And I said, deal I'll take it and so off I go quickly grab a clean shirt and put all my uniform stuff on it and uh, off I went to the airport and deadheaded to Tampa no where did we deadhead to Orlando and then we flew from Orlando to LaGuardia again last night staying uh, this time right across the street at the uh, Courtyard Marriott in uh, at LaGuardia and then uh, we flew down today, um, nice uh, report time, I think uh, 9.30 this morning at the hotel, and uh, flew this thing down from, or flew an 88 down, excuse me, from uh, New York to here, and here I am. So, you're all caught up. Now, for those of you who only listen to after the first half hour, <laughs> welcome to the show. <laughs> uh, I've just been catching everybody up on um, what's been happening. Uh, the last week or so, and uh, and this is why when you're listening to this show or watching it right now, uh, why you're getting it a little bit later than you normally do. I doubt that I'll be able to get it out uh, tonight, Friday night, but uh, Saturday tomorrow I'll be able to uh, work on it a little bit either before or after the other podcast that I do Saturday mornings. So it should be 
In your podcast inbox, uh, sometime Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, I hope. Okay, so there we go. Um, Had a great four-day trip, and this trip has been fine, too. Didn't do a lot, you know, just hit the sack last night. And um, Oh, uh, Lent uh, just started. Uh, Ash Wednesday was uh, the day before yesterday, and uh, that uh, for for people who practice uh, their Catholic faith, uh, we usually give up something or take on something extra or, uh, you know, you, there are several different things that you can do if you're uh, um, a practicing Catholic, and as I am. And uh, so this, and I've tried this in the past, and I'm, I'm really feeling good about it this time. I am going to actually give up drinking alcohol uh, for the entire season of Lent. Yeah, that's going to be tough. So I I told Stephanie that um, if I get another Charlotte layover, I probably won't call her if it's still during Lent because I I don't think I'll be able to watch somebody drink all those great craft beers and not be able to enjoy it. So I'm I'm going to do this. This is not something that you have to do. Uh, It's just something that uh, a lot of people elect to do. And it should be something that is kind of hard to do something that maybe causes a little bit of pain, <laughs> and this is going to cause me pain, trust me. Uh, but I'm hoping that uh, that'll do me good, uh, both physically, mentally, and spiritually. Uh, I'm doing some other stuff as well, but this is no longer the Catholic Pilot Show. This is the Airline Pilot Guy, so you don't want to hear all about that. Uh, well, at least most of you don't, so I'll just uh, go with that and tell you that uh, for the next just under 40 days or whatever. I'm, I'm not going to be telling you about all the great stories of uh, drinking great beer with great uh, friends, unfortunately. So there we go. So let's uh, move on and talk a little bit about one of our favorite subjects, or at least one of mine. I don't know if you can hear that or not. It sounds very faint to me. Let's see. I'm doing this a little bit differently than I normally do. Yeah, I can hear that. The Java Jive by the Ink Spots, recorded in 1940. Kind of uh, conflicting a bit with the uh, the background music and the overhead speakers. I have no control over that, unfortunately. Okay, so. Coffee Fund. What's that all about? Well, if you want to learn about what the Coffee Fund is, basically it's uh, a couple things. It's a way for you to help me uh, pay for some of the costs of doing the show. The show is mostly a a labor of love, but I do have some costs, server costs, uh, web hosting costs, etc. And those are about to go up, I have a feeling. Uh, Now it's almost getting too loud, so let me turn this down here. Anyway, um, and also, it's a way for you to uh, buy me a cup of coffee if you're watching the video and holding up a cup of Starbucks. So thank you, one and all, for considering contributing to my coffee fund. And you can do that by heading over to Airline Pilot Guy slash coffee. Learn all about the different ways you can help support the show. So, in the meantime, let me head over here to my list of uh, people who have contributed and uh, I may be mentioning your name more than once because I did I forgot to write down who I talked about on the last show so let's start with um, uh, Garrett Kevin Aiden Marie Steve Garen Timothy David Justin and Jeff Muller thank you each and every one of you for uh, continuing to keep me in mind for uh, my my caffeine fund and Let's also mention those uh, who are new to the uh, Patreon uh, system. My new patrons are, let me see here. I think I talked about Dylan and Julia last time. I think the new ones since the last show, Greg, David, and Father Jeremiah Payne. So thank you, all of you, for joining up as a patron on the Airline Pilot Guy Patreon fund, coffee fund thing. Okay, well, the Ink Spots are stopping their singing, so that means it's time for me to stop talking about that. So, again, thank you everybody for that. So, best thing to do at this point probably is to play this.
Yeah, adjusted the uh, exposure on the uh, camera a little bit to show you the uh, the window outside. I was hoping you'd be able to see airplanes landing and taking off, but now that I look out the window myself, it looks like all you can see really is a jetway. So, <laughs> so much for that. So let me uh, readjust the uh, exposure there and lock it down. There we go. Okay, so the news. Let's start with... this. Um, I'm not sure if somebody sent this to me or not, but uh, Ryanair. Oh yes, Ernest Aguayo, or Aguayo, Aguayo. I think that's what you pronounce your name, Ernest, your last name. Ryanair's colorful CEO is in the travel headlines again, Michael O'Leary. But this time it's not for promising to someday charge passengers for using the bathroom in flight. Uh, Michael O'Leary said his airline plans to offer flights from Europe to the United States for as little as $14. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure how he's going to do that. He says he can make money in Europe with uh, 99 cent fares. Uh, but uh, somebody pointed out that, well, they don't really have any airplanes that can make it all the way to the United States. And I don't know if that's true or not, but um, according to this article, it says that uh, first they're going to have to get some airplanes that are capable of that long range flying. And then he also said um, the uh, there will also need to be a very high number of business or premium seats. To make up, of course, for that uh, fourteen dollar or ten dollar ten euros price for airfare, uh, but in true Ryanair style, expect to pay for the extras. The airline charges fees for bags, seat assignments, credit card transactions, and printed boarding passes. So we have that. Asiana Airlines was penalized five hundred thousand dollars over the San Francisco crash. Uh, let's see, because they failed to assist family members of passengers on a flight that crashed last year at the San Francisco airport, federal transportation officials said Tuesday. The fine announced by the U.S. Department of Transportation was a first. No airline has ever broken U.S. laws that require prompt and generous assistance to the loved ones of crash victims. And uh, let's see, they did, uh, so they're going to actually pay $400,000 to the uh, Department of Transportation in a fine, and they get a $100,000 credit for costs in sponsoring multiple industry-wide conferences and training sessions uh, in 2013, 2014, and 2015 to provide lessons learned. Let's see, moving on. This is uh, thanks to Kevin St. John. Uh, again, it has something to do with the pilot shortage. The nation's regional airlines are having trouble hiring enough pilots, the government says. Uh, suggesting one reason may be that they simply don't pay enough. Okay, the um, this is a report by the General Accounting Office, the GAO. Uh, they did two studies reviewed by them, uh, point to the large number of qualified pilots that already exist but may be working abroad, in the military or in another occupation, as evidence that there is adequate supply. It's just that uh, their report showed that. Um, Nobody is willing to pay for uh, the very, very low starting wages at the regionals. So that's why the regionals are experiencing such a shortage. So that's not really news, is it? The news here is that uh, at least uh, it's not something that ALPA is saying or uh, other pilot unions, uh, whatever. It's actually a governmental agency, the Government Accountability Office. And they're basically saying, uh, yeah, uh, that's true. You know, you need to do something about increasing the wages and make it wages and benefits so that uh, good people who want to, you know, make a career of it in this industry uh, are attracted to uh, get their experience in the regionals. Otherwise, you're just going to uh, end up seeing a very uh, shrinking regional airline industry because nobody's willing to pay or uh, fly for these very, very low wages unless there are people that really just have a super big passion for flying and know that uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But that tunnel may be a really long one for some of you. So, 
All right, let's move on with it. Oh, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, we've heard about this in previous shows, people talking about multi-crew pilot licenses. Uh, Canada just adopted the multi-crew pilot license concept. Uh, they're joining uh, European and Asian countries in adopting the multi-crew pilot's license as a means of keeping the seats, the right seats, of its airliners populated. In contrast to the United States, where Congress has decided how many hours a pilot must have before clipping on the tie and the three stripes, Canada and other countries are adopting an international civil aviation organization design program that takes ab initio students through at least 250 hours of airline-oriented flight training and 750 hours of ground school and makes them first officers on airliners in 12 to 18 months. Canada's Ministry of Transport la announced last week that the license will be added to Transport Canada's list of approved pilot certification standards and the next step is to start certifying aviation training organizations to teach the courses. So that's interesting. Will the United States also jump on board with the multi-crew license concept? I don't know. Um, not really, really sure about that. And interestingly, when I d was doing a little bit of research on a multi-crew license, uh, I learned something that I hadn't realized before. And most countries around the world license their pilots. But, and I've, I am guilty of saying that I have an airline transport pilot license, but I don't. I have an airline transport pilot certificate. In the United States system, we're not licensed, we're certified. And I thought, hmm, well, what's the difference? So I went to a couple different Wikipedia sites to learn more about certification versus licensing, and it turns out that under the certification program that I'm in, involved with, uh, if the FAA wants to decertify me or take away my certificate, which means I can't exercise my, 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 I want to say license again, my privileges of flying an airline transport jet, uh, they can. Uh, they can do that without any legal proceedings. Uh, if you have a license, then if somebody wants to pull your, your license, they have to go through some kind of a judicial system. So, um, I had not realized that. So, I apologize for all the many times that I said I had a license and talked about private pilot's licenses and everything else. It's certificates and privileges and categories and ratings and all that kind of stuff. So, I'm getting schooled by doing some more research. So, will the United States uh, adopt the multi-crew pilot license or certification concept? I don't know. They may have to. I know that many airlines already, uh, especially the regionals, are knocking at Congress's door saying, hey, you got to give us some relief here with this 1,500-hour flying uh, requirement and the airline transport pilot certificate requirement. We're having trouble keeping uh, pilots in our cockpits. And, uh, of course, many of us say, okay, well, uh, pay more money for your pilots and then you won't have a problem with a shortage. The problem with that, of course, is the way our system works now in the United States, the regional airlines are contracting uh, or bidding with the major airlines to provide their feeder services to these smaller markets. And what the airlines do is they wait for the lowest bid to come in, and that's the one they accept. So in order for these regional airlines to you know, get a contract with a major airline like Acme or United or American or Delta, they have to, you know, be the lowest bidder, uh, basically. And the way to do that is to cut costs any way they can, and of course, not paying their pilots very much money is a way to do it. Uh, if they have to start paying better wages and benefits for their pilots, that means that uh, their costs are going to go up. And uh, one of a couple things can happen, as I see it. Either uh, the airlines are going to have to pay more for those services. Um, maybe some of these regionals are going to go out of business and the strongest will survive. That's a possibility. Or perhaps another possibility is that uh, eventually the major airlines will take over all that kind of flying and do their own feeding, fly the smaller uh, jets and turboprops themselves, and then basically the regional airline model will go uh, out of existence. I don't know. What's your opinion about that? What do you think is going to happen here? I know something's going to happen going to have to because uh, we can't sustain the current system that we have much longer. 
And as I mentioned before, the uh, the major airlines probably not worried about a shortage because there are a lot of very highly qualified, highly skilled pilots out there flying for the regionals right now and other and, and overseas, as the uh, uh, report mentioned. And uh, they are more than willing to come and fly for the major airlines here who have um, very competitive wages and, and good benefits, comparatively speaking. So, all right, enough of that. Um, I mentioned in the teaser at the beginning a 19-year-old San Bernardino County woman has been arrested for pointing a laser at an aircraft. Uh, these people aren't very smart. Jenny, not, not, a, not the brightest uh, light or not the sharpest uh, knife in the drawer, uh, she... Uh, what happened here? Looks like my phone is doing something. Let me make sure. Okay, we're still recording, good. Um, Jenny was arrested on February 27th about uh, 10.50 p.m. A sheriff's patrol helicopter was flying over the 15 freeway in Hesperia, or Hesperia, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, it's a California town, when it was struck multiple times with a laser coming from a moving vehicle. Both the pilot and flight officer were tempor temporarily blinded by the laser beam, authorities said. The helicopter crew followed the car and directed deputies to its location. Deputies quickly identified a female passenger in the vehicle as being involved with the incident. They also located the green laser, which was used to target the helicopter. Uh, Jenny was arrested and booked at the High Desert Detention Center. And if convicted, she faces more than $260,000 in fines and up to five years in federal prison. So, uh, as, uh, as it always goes, these criminals aren't very smart. Uh, if you're going to point... Well, no, I'm not even going to say that. Never mind. But not very bright to point a laser at a police helicopter. Just not smart. And finally, many of you sent this to me. And, I, you know, I really struggled with whether or not to say anything about this because I don't want anybody to misconstrue my remarks about this. Um... I, although I think my remarks are very reasonable. Um, let's do it. Um, I'll just read this one article that somebody uh, sent me a link to. Um, sexist remarks about a female pilot left on a passenger's napkin aboard a Calgary flight bound for Victoria Sunday. This was WestJet Airlines. Have prompted a heated response from the seasoned flyer herself. Uh, Carrie Stacy, a pilot of 17 years who currently works for WestJet, said she was shocked when alerted to the message left by someone named David, who was believed to be seated in seat 12E aboard flight number 463. David wrote that the cockpit of an airplane is no place for a woman and asked that WestJet alert him the next time a fair lady is in the helm so I can book another flight. Uh, let's see, I, they have a picture here of the, uh, the napkin on which the... Uh, uh, the gentleman, the man, wrote the note to Captain slash WestJet. The cockpit of an airliner is no place for a woman. A woman being a mother is the most honor, not as captain. Uh, where something matters, not pilots, WestJet. And then he cites a Bible verse, Proverbs 31. Um, let's see. The uh, captain, Miss Stacy, said, uh, I respectfully disagree with your opinion that the cockpit, we now call it flight deck, is no... Oh, I'm not going to read that. Well, you know, a lot of people, I don't want to get into that, but I, again, I call it a cockpit because that's what it is. It's based on the old ship's things, and it has nothing to do with a male anatomy, part of a male's anatomy. It, uh, it has something to do with a shipping term, and that was a place where the ship captains steered the ship. So, uh, it is a, a flight deck to me is the thing that you land on on an aircraft carrier. That's just me. Uh, you know, if you want to call it a flight deck, that's fine. Um, she said, in fact, there are no places that are not for ladies anymore. Um, Stacy also indicated the same passenger questioned flight attendants about whether she had an adequate number of flight hours. Reached at her home in Surrey Monday. Stacy said she'd never previously encountered such rude remarks from a passenger. I just couldn't believe there are still country 
still people in this country that think like that, she said. It just shocked me. So, um, yeah, let me uh, see here. I only had uh, part of the message before. Uh, P.S. I wish WestJet could tell me a fair lady is at the helm so I can book another flight. In the end, this is all mere vanity. Not impressed. Respectfully in love, Daniel. <laughs> okay. So, there is the message, and uh, many of you asked me, well, what's your take on this, Captain Jeff? Well, um, I'm going to read what I wrote to one of my listeners. Uh, and at the time, as I mentioned, I wasn't sure I would really comment on this because, uh, you know, you got to be careful. People can misconstrue things that I say, and I don't want anybody to misunderstand where I come from. And so in my response to this listener, uh, the listener said, um, I think you should talk about it, and I think you should, you should tell or read exactly what you wrote to me. And I went, okay. So here goes. Um, I've received many forwards, emails, Facebook messages to me regarding this, and I'm not really sure whether I should comment on it or not, as I'm sure my comments may be misunderstood. And as you've noted, there is a much bigger issue than women flying jets. It's about the role of women in our society, and it just so happens that the venue for this particular incident was an airliner. For the record, I don't see where a person's gender has anything to do with being able to perform a job unless it has something to do with that person's physical characteristics. Uh, in other words, jobs needing greater than normal upper body strength, or uh, although some women are stronger than many men, um, I think you get the picture. I have flown with many people over my 32 plus years as a pilot. And being a good pilot, average pilot, below average pilot, is fairly distributed among males, females, ethnicities, religious affiliations, flying backgrounds, etc. So it doesn't make a bit of difference to me. I also strongly believe that the number one job for all of us who are parents is the upbringing, nurturing, education of and providing for our children, regardless of what mom or dad does outside of the home. For the majority of us at this point in history, the burden of providing the major source of income falls upon the father. That, of course, has been shifting over time, and more of the burden is being shared more equally now, and in some cases, predominantly by the mom. I believe that each family situation is unique to the talents, skills, characteristics of each parent, and as long as the upbringing of the children is the priority, it's all good. Then I said, wow, I didn't mean to expound upon this that much. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, there we go. That's, uh, that's my response about this. Again, let me reiterate. Um, I, I don't think that this particular incident um, is, uh, or the feelings that this passenger shares is that uncommon. In fact, I, I fly with some, pe some people that don't outwardly say things like this or express that viewpoint. Now, and I do actually fly with some that do say uh, derogatory things about women or other ethnicities occupying cockpits and uh, or flight decks if you prefer um, and I don't think that's right to say and um, I as I mentioned in my response to the listener that uh, I, I really truly believe that it, it doesn't matter you know what what your sex is what your gender is I should say uh, what color you are uh, what your national origin is, um, because again, being a pilot, um, the skills of being a pilot are fairly relatively or fairly evenly distributed among all those different other characteristics. So again, it depends on the, uh, the family situation. Each is unique, and uh, I'm not here to judge or make a derogatory comment one way or another. So, with that said, I think that's best for me to just leave it there, and uh, I thank you, all of you, for pointing that out to me, um, and uh, I, I'm glad now that I had a chance to comment on it, and I guess the best thing to do at this point would just be to move on. So let me go over here back to my Evernote application, make sure there wasn't anything else that I wanted to talk about for... Uh, the news section of the show this week. I don't think so. I think that's about it. So let's move on to your feedback, shall we?
Captain. Incoming message. Okay, let's start off with Chad. First of all, I want to say I really like the look of the changes you made to your website. Very nice. Well, thanks, Chad. And you can thank Arash for that. Secondly, not to venture too far into the macabre, uh, or, or macabre, I guess is the way you pronounce it. I have a few questions about an airline tragedy that is nearing its 30-year anniversary. As I'm sure you will remember, on August 2, 1985, a Delta Airlines Flight 191 was traveling from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to Dallas, Texas. On a final approach, the L-1011 crashed after encountering, ver encountering very severe wind shear that was associated with a thunderstorm located above the airport. The flight crew was seemingly very experienced, with the captain having logged nearly 30,000 hours and both the first and second officers having logged over 6,000 hours. Uh, the cockpit voice recording of the incident is available on YouTube. He has a link there. And is very disturbing to listen to for a few reasons beyond the obvious. It seems as though the crew realized the situation they were about to encounter but did nothing to attempt to abort the landing or react until it was too late. There is also a video on YouTube from a 1996 documentary showing uh, a Delta Airlines training captain, Charlie Phipps, flying a simulator in the same weather conditions as Flight 191. I'm guessing a lot of Captain Phipps' commentary is dra dra dramatized for the documentary, but throughout the entire sequence, there was an underlying tone of, I think we'll be fine. It almost seemed like he was trying to convince himself that everything was okay. This tragedy resulted in many recommendations and changes for the airline industry within the United States, including requirements of how airlines train pilots for wind shear encounters, changes to the technology used to detect wind shear environments near major airports, ensuring airlines require their pilots review policies that prohibit flight crews from landing or taking off if their flight paths are near, under, or through a thunderstorm, and numerous others. In this case, it seems as though the flight crew simply ignored the warning signs. Maybe this was a case of one or all of the flight crew becoming complacent. I've landed in bad successfully. Uh, well, I've landed in bad conditions successfully before, so I'm sure everything will be okay. I know it's been nearly 30 years, but I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on this. In dynamic situations such as this one, have you seen a situation when a pilot or entire flight crew? are clearly ignoring obvious signs that things aren't right, either because they are convinced nothing bad will happen, even though the circumstances are suggesting otherwise, or maybe because they're intentionally trying to push their luck in order to keep a schedule, or maybe even for their ego. What do you think? Sorry for the lengthy question. Feel free to make this episode three hours long and blame it on me. <laughs> okay, Chad, if it goes that long, it's your fault. Uh, thank you for the question. Great uh, recap of the uh, accident. Uh, again, just to recap, um, on approach at Dallas-Fort Worth International, uh, they were getting vectored in for final approach on runway, well, what is now runway 17 center, but I think at the time it was 17 left. I don't think they had the other runways that were further to the east at the time. No. And uh, they were asked to slow down to their minimum approach speed because there was, I believe, a Learjet in front of them on final. So they're, they're flying at a little bit lower speed than they normally would be at that point in the approach. They were looking at weather on the radar, uh, some pretty severe-looking thunderstorm cells. And uh, they flew through one, and they, of course, experienced a microburst uh, and crashed. Now, we learned a lot about wind shear from an accident that happened at Idlewild International Airport, which is now John F. Kennedy Airport, a 727, I believe an Eastern Airlines 727. In fact, uh, when I was living in Mobile, uh, the um, family living across the street, the, uh, the father, uh, the husband, was on that flight. He worked for the Coast Guard, and he was traveling to New York on business and he died in that accident. And that was one of the first ones that really brought a lot of attention to this phenomenon called wind shear. Uh, although this accident occurred many years later, and although we were learning more and more about wind shear and how to uh, be safe when encountering it and going through wind shear recovery procedures, etc., we really didn't know that much about microbursts, which is a, an associated phenomenon to uh, the wind shear 
experience. And uh, that's what uh, the uh, the L-1011 found itself in. And uh, basically, uh, they're low energy at that point because of their lower speed uh, and uh, the uh, late reactions to adding power and shifting from a high performance mode to a low performance mode and then basically being behind the, uh, the power curve to uh, have the necessary power to fly through it. Uh, they end up crashing. They were pretty close to recovering, but uh, didn't quite make it. They ran out of altitude. So, um, yeah, I'm sure that there was a maybe a little bit of complacency in there. Uh, we all kind of experience this thought that uh, I've I've been through this kind of situation before. I'm sure it's going to be okay. Um, the the jets in front of us went through the same weather that that we're about to encounter, and they made it okay. Uh, it's very easy to kind of get in that kind of mindset. I've talked about that before on the on the, uh, a previous episode. Um, when you are not the commanding officer on the f- on the flight deck cockpit, you kind of sometimes um, experience something I like to call co-pilot co-pilot itis, and in this case, second officer itis as well. <laughs> that uh, you know, maybe you sense something is wrong, and maybe you sense you, you should say something, but you don't. Uh, I can I can kind of relate a personal experience that I had uh, many many years ago as a co-pilot on a 727. Uh, we were flying into Atlanta. The localizer or the uh, glide scope was was out of service on the runway to which we were flying the approach, and so it was a localizer only. It was a relatively nice day, although you could see some weather as an isolated cell moving toward the airport coming in from the southwest. In fact, it was one of those kind of things, if you live in the southeastern United States, you know what I mean, you'll see a wall of rain kind of heading your way. We could see that coming in. And uh, and I was just doing a little bit of uh, mental calculation that by the time we were going to be crossing the threshold of that runway was going to be about the time that that wall of rain was going to be uh, hitting that end of the runway. And in fact, as we were making our way on final, you could see that rain um, obscuring the far end of the runway and moving pretty rapidly toward the middle of the runway. I made a comment to the captain saying, hey, um, I'll just call him Bill. I don't re- really remember what his name was. Hey, Bill, why don't we, uh, why don't we say we're going to go around here and then just, you know, by the time we go back around, this thing is going to have already moved over, you know, across the airport and it'll be all clear. And he said basically, well, now nah, just keep going. It'll, it'll be okay. I'm the pilot flying. At that point, I should have said, nope, this is not going to work. We're going to go around. We're going to avoid this, um, you know, this weather that's ahead of us that's going to prevent us from landing safely. But I didn't. I, we kept on going. And a couple hundred feet above the ground, those big drops started smacking the windscreen of the airplane. You know, you've been in your car on one of those days where it's a, you're about to get a really, really heavy downpour and those big, giant raindrops splat, splat, hitting your windshield. And that's what happened to us. And I'm thinking... There is absolutely no way I'm going to be able to see anything to safely get the airplane on the ground because of the way it's moving. You know, you could just tell. And finally, I said, okay, that's enough. I'm going around. And I put the power to go around power. And there was a, a few moments where the airplane was not accelerating, was not climbing, and uh, and we were shaking pretty violently. We were going through that, that weather, and uh, we were basically experiencing a wind shear. And uh, it was uh, not a good place to be. And we popped out of the other side and had an incredible performance and had to really pull the power back to idle and try to level off the airplane and recover from this uh, encounter. And that made a big impact on me. That was a, really the first time that I realized that I'd fallen for that copilotitis kind of um, effect and that, um, that I'm responsible for the safety just as much as the captain is. And if the captain is going to put us in a situation that's going to be dangerous, I should say something or do something and then talk about it later. So, uh, as I said, that made a big impact on me and um, helped me get over that feeling that I have to always kind of uh, let the captain do and listen to what he says, and and even if it means putting us in a not great situation. So we get on the ground. You know, we went back around, of course. By the time we are back in sequence, uh, that whole system has cleared the the airport and it's nice and sunny and we land taxi to the gate get off the airplane start walking to our next gate as we are walking 
through the transportation mall the, or the tunnel underneath the uh, airport between terminals. I'm talking to Captain Bill and, you know, actually we're not saying very much of anything. I think we both feel like all three of us in that cockpit know that we went through something that probably shouldn't we shouldn't have been in. And finally he says something like, you know, that's the very first time I've ever had to go around at Acme. Now this guy had been a captain for more than 20 years. Well, not been a captain, but he had been a pilot at Acme for more than 20 years. I figured he'd probably been a captain more than 10 years, maybe closer to 15 years. And I'm thinking to myself, what? You've never had to go around? So it kind of all made a lot of sense at that point. This man, for him, every time there was a bad situation, it always turned out well. It, it always went the right way. So based on that experience, he figured, why wouldn't this one work out? So <laughs> that's, uh, that's one of those things, uh, as you say, Chad, that uh, even when things sound or look like they aren't quite right, why do people still continue with it? And uh, that's just part of our, our human nature, I guess, one of our, one of our failings as human beings. And uh, it's important that we understand that uh, we may experience this, this feeling uh, at some point and that we need to try to work through that and ignore it and say, you know what, this is not safe. I'm not going to let this person do this because it's dangerous and if they have a problem with it then let's just get through the whole thing safely and then after the fact go to the chief pilot and we'll talk to him about it and uh, I think in most cases if anything looks like it could possibly affect the safe operation of the flight the chief pilot is going to back you the one that decided to take the safe course of action so all right, enough of that. Uh, thank you for mentioning the um, the anniversary. I can't believe it's already been that many years. 30 years. Wow. Since that uh, crash. Thanks, Chad. Brian writes, uh, oh, uh, he's talking about the uh, episode that I recorded when I, while I was in Indianapolis. He said, hearing the sirens outside of your hotel in Indianapolis jolted me back to a flashback of some time I spent there a few years ago. You, re you might remember that I used to work in the newspapers. The single coolest event I ever covered by a long shot was the 2006 Final Four of the NCAA Men's Basketball Championship held in Indy. I was one of three people from our paper there to cover George Mason University, which made a miraculous run in the tournament. I spent about a week there, and the experience was everything you could imagine. Attached, you'll find a pic I snapped from my seat. That's UCLA warming up. Anyway, the crux of the story. I think we also stayed in the Hyatt, though it may have been the Westin. Regardless, we got about a severe weather one night. The intercom came through my phone requesting that all guests report to one of the lower-level ballrooms because downtown Indianapolis was under a tornado warning. I think we all got shoved into what was the press workroom. Thankfully, the event pressed uh, passed without anything bad happening. But I was, I too was up pretty high, probably around the 15th floor, and I was more than happy to take the intercom's advice. Thanks for letting me tell the story. I have some good beer places in mind for your next DC layover. I hope this finds you well, and I hope spring finds us all soon. <laughs> yes, Brian, I do as well. Brian Hunziker in DC. Let me look at the time here. I think I have time to answer another one or two before I have to shut this thing down from the Sarasota airport and get it all packed up so I can take my flight home. This is from Sam. Hey Jeff, it's uh, Sam from Alabama again. Don't know if you remember, but I asked about being an Air Force pilot with allergies. Still chasing that dream. Anyways, when you were in the Air Force, how many travel opportunities did you get? Are there plenty of opportunities to go abroad? Space A travel. Um, yeah. I did that when I was in the uh, military, and um, it's a lot like you know non-revenue travel in the uh, in the airlines, except for it's different. <laughs> a lot of the airplanes don't even have proper airline seats. Some of the transports they'll put in pallets that actually have airline seats on them. Some transports, like the C5, actually have uh, a section 
on the upper deck toward the back, so like about the little bit further the midway back toward the tail on that top compartment there is uh, permanently configured airline style seats facing backwards. Um, I and my wife took, or my wife and I took a Space A, which stands for Space Available Trip, uh, to Japan um, via the C-5 at a Travis Air Force Base. And uh, it was an interesting trip because I think it was a double refueling mission. So as the C-5 was making its way to uh, to Japan, it uh, was doing training as well. And uh, being toward the back part of the uh, airplane uh, during air refueling is always kind of an interesting experience. You know, if you're at all someone who gets airsick easily, that was not the place you want because the rudder back there is kind of moving around and making little minute adjustments for uh, the air refueling procedure. That was uh, that was interesting. But anyway, it didn't cost us a thing, or maybe it cost like $10 or something. I flew into um, Yokota Air Base uh, outside of Tokyo, and we uh, kind of had a a second honeymoon in uh, Tokyo. We also took a little excursion from Yokota over to Seoul, uh, South Korea, actually um, Osan Air Force Base, and did a little shopping and then left. My wife was not impressed, by the way. She said, I never want to go there again. <laughs> so uh, I think it had something to do with the people aggressively trying to sell things to us that she uh, didn't like. And uh, also the hotel we ended up staying in was not a five-star hotel, and my wife refused to take her shoes off or her clothes off, and I don't even think she brushed her teeth, or she, if she did, she used Coke or something. <laughs> she, uh, yeah, it was not a good trip going to uh, South Korea, for my wife anyway. But uh, Japan, we had a great time. Um, and before that, uh, we uh, took a space-available flight from... Um, from Travis to Hawaii and spent several days there. So, uh, yeah, there are travel opportunities for sure um, in the military, in the Air Force in particular. So, uh, took advantage of it a couple times. Thanks for your uh, feedback, Sam, and uh, thanks for listening. And I hope that your uh, your dream comes true, the one you're chasing there. All right, you know what? I think it's time for me to shut down. Uh, things are starting to get a little bit busy and noisier here in the terminal. Uh, I guess people are uh, coming in for their the next round of flights here and uh, probably time for me to go ahead and pack everything up and then I'll finish this up when I get home. So, you know the deal. Don't go anywhere. Hello and welcome back to the Airline Pilot Guy episode number 107 and... Just a few minutes ago, I was in Sarasota Bradenton International Airport uh, in the concourse area recording our show, or the show. Well, it's our show. And I wasn't sure when I'd be able to finish up the show. I uh, got home yesterday evening, and it was kind of a late night getting uh, back together with the family and didn't have a chance to uh, record anymore. It's now Saturday morning, actually afternoon. This morning, I got up and uh, recorded the Catholic Weekend show that I do every Saturday morning. And now that I'm finished with that, I have about, well, about an hour, maybe a little less, to uh, record as much as I can before I uh, get ready to go to my daughter's uh, dance performance. Um, and then I'll come back and maybe finish this up tonight. Boy, it's just going to be a a long process recording this episode. So again, thanks for bearing with me. And let's continue. May, may, I'd like to make sure that everything is recording. It looks like that is recording. It looks like uh, that is recording. Okay, good. All right. So let's do something like this. <laughs> Okay, let's see. I think we stopped with uh, Sam's question about Air Force space available travel. And so let's continue with Greg. He says, I've been meaning to send feedback on episode 99 regarding a story similar to Bill Overstreet's and had not gotten around to it until now. When I heard the fake story on the police radar clocking the tornado and being, or tornado, uh, being lined up for a kill in episode 104. First, that story. It's been around for years and years and has varied between Scotland, England, and the United States. 
Each time the radar gun triggers the systems on the aircraft to lock onto the hostile signal and arm a missile. In this case, a Sidewinder, an infrared heat-guided missile. How a low-level navigation radar band radar gun could do that, I don't know. Whilst the aircraft may have detected it, its systems would ignore it. This link is one of my many showing it's a fake. And then he has a link to Snopes.com about the fake radar story. Well, still a fun story. <laughs> okay, so it was fake, but it was still a good story. The second item was the reference to Bill Overstreet flying under the Eiffel Tower whilst chase chasing a German pilot during World War II. It reminded me of a vaguely similar act of daring do I heard at my local flying club a few years ago. We had a catered dinner with a couple of guest speakers who were World War II veterans and flew in the de Havilland Mosquito as pathfinders. These were the guys who went in ahead of the bombers and marked the targets. They then hung around during the raid to either remark whilst the bombs were falling and then afterwards to do damage assessments. One of the guys mentioned that about a week after the war ended in Europe, all of the pathfinders were told that they had a free flight. In other words, they could pick anywhere, city or town in Europe, and were given a plane and fuel to go sightseeing over the site. This particular pilot and his navigator selected Stuttgart, I think it was, and the church spire he had seen many times in his previous missions. So off they went. They got to Stuttgart, and with the two Rolls-Royce Merlins at full noise and 80 feet showing on the altimeter, they streaked through the main street of Stuttgart to the church spire at 300 knots. As they whipped into a turn around the spire with a mosquito on its wingtip, the pilot momentarily saw a U.S. Hudson bomber doing the same thing from the opposite direction. He said how they missed each other he doesn't know, but saw the fleeting look of astonishment on the other pilot's face as they flash flashed past each other at over 500 knots. He quickly climbed and headed home without saying much to his navigator, who hadn't seen the oncoming aircraft. Anyway, Jeff, keep up the great work. I hope the weather in the U.S. gets better soon. Here in Sydney, we've been struggling with temps in the high 30s, uh, low to mid 40s. Oh, that's Celsius, by the way. <laughs> so, let's see, low 30s, or so we're talking like uh, mid 90s to the, I don't know, 105-ish. That's that's hot, so uh, yeah, you you have um, uh, temperatures. You're struggling with temperatures at, temperatures at the other end of the of the band, right? The higher temperatures, where we're still struggling here in the U.S. with those cold temperatures, at least up here in the northern hemisphere. I think today in uh, in Roswell, Georgia, where I am right now in my basement studio, as you can tell, oh, it's actually 62. A nice day out there. Um, I think it was down in the 40s uh, Fahrenheit uh, last night, but uh, now it's a pretty nice day out there. I just took the dogs out for a walk, uh, a quick walk, and uh, it was very pleasant. Nice sunny day. And uh, Okay, excuse me. Hmm. All right, so thanks again, Greg, for the snopesing of, or setting us straight about that uh, uh, story about the radar gun and the uh, missile locking onto it. At first, I, was I thought you were going to tell me that Bill Overstreet's story was a fake. That would have really disappointed me. But it wasn't. Okay. Richard from Sweden says, I flew as a passenger to a small city in Kazakhstan in a modern Embraer, daylight, 100% snow cover, no cloud, and visibility to the ground. No cloud and visibility to the ground. Okay, so I, mean, I guess there was no visibility. It was like complete whiteout, I, I'm gathering. We approached the airfield and started to wander around seemingly aimlessly at low level. He's guessing two to 3,000 feet or more in the area. This went on for 15 minutes, and then the pilot took full power, climbed, and re returned to Astana an hour later. The reason was, quote, sudden fog which I'd never heard of as far as I could see visibility was clear. Oh, I thought you said it. Okay, so there were no clouds, and the visibility was good. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, have you heard of sudden fog? I know it's snowing in your part of the world, 
Can snow blow, blowing over the runway obscure it suddenly? There did not appear to be much wind, but I can't say. My guess is the airfield was not prepared or the pilots could not locate the field, which I find hard to believe with navigational aids today. On that subject, does the aircraft GPS have a level of accurate accuracy to take the jet directly over the runway so that the pilot literally looks over his or her shoulder? Your view from your side of the cockpit appreciated. Richard from Sweden. Okay, so I'm not really sure what happened in this case. Uh, you're saying you're looking out the window, blue skies and snow on the ground, and kind of flew around for a while and then went around and went back to your origin uh, city, and they said something about sudden fog. Well, I guess it's possible that a, a thin layer of fog formed right over the runway area or right over the ground, and it looks you know clear in a million everywhere you look, but like a very, very small little blanket covering the ground, which obscures the runway. And in that case, no matter what kind of, unless you have a Category 3B landing system, which means that you can, uh, in some airplanes, some installations, and you know, it depends on the facilities at the airport, and it depends on the facilities or the, uh, uh, the instruments uh, and the avionics on the airplane, uh, you can land with basically no visibility whatsoever and not see anything. But yeah, at, at some point, you got to see the runways to, to taxi uh, the airplane off the runway. There is something called Category 3C, uh, which doesn't really exist anywhere in the world. I think that uh, Heathrow, for a, a short period of time years ago, had a system where you could land, not see anything. The airplane touches down, uh, applies the brakes, slows down, and actually taxis the airplane to the gate, uh, but it, it, it involves a quite, uh, well, quite a vol involved um, setup for instrumentation and, and uh, navigational aids on the ground to do that. Very expensive. Only um, a few airplanes um, are equipped to do that kind of um, approach and landing and taxiing on the ground. The L-1011 TriStar, by the way, was one airplane that was all set up to do that. Uh, but as far as I know, I think there was only one place in the world that had that capability, and it was only for a short time, and they realized that it just wasn't uh, cost-effective. Uh, so uh, in this situation in Kazakhstan, I'm not even sure if they have a Category 3 landing system. Uh, they probably have Category 1, maybe Category 2, and basically you can't go below 100 feet if you don't have um, enough visual references to land safely on the runway. So I'm guessing that's that that's what happened there. Uh, your question about does the GPS have a level of accuracy to take the jet directly over the runway? Yes, it does. Um, the GPS navigational systems on the airplanes these days are very, very accurate. Uh, so, um, yeah, hope that answers your question, um, Richard. Again, not being there, not knowing the exact situation, I'm not really sure what to tell you, but my guess is that there was just a, a thin layer of um, fog that was obscuring the... Uh, I remember f landing at Travis Air Force Base when I was in the Air Force in the 141, and you could see forever. It was just brilliantly clear. It was, a, it was at night, and you could see all the lights, but um, as we approached the uh, Air Force Base, uh, you could see the muffled lights of the ground and the and the runway and the taxiways through this layer of fog that was literally on the ground and extended maybe 20, 30 feet. So it was just a blanket covering the ground. And we couldn't land because there we, we wouldn't be able to, once we got into it, we, we wouldn't be able to see anything. Couldn't keep the uh, airplane on the runway or a taxi or anything else. So... Uh, that is definitely a possibility, and that's probably what happened there. Kevin McGrady, um, uh, the Catholic, um, what do we call it, um, cabin crew member for the newly formed, well, he calls it um, not Acme, but Roadrunner Airlines out in the desert. He sent me a picture of a seat, and there's a safety information card lying on the, 
on the seat, and it says A321, and then um, a couple seat belts. He didn't really say, he just put, here's another pick. And I think what he was trying to show me here is that the seat belt, the one that has the male um, buckle, part of the buckle, has this, um, uh, it's like, it's not a regular belt, it's more like a, um, uh, like a bag, like a, uh, what, what, what would I call that? Uh, like a bean bag kind of look to it around that part of the belt. And I'm assuming what that is, is one of those airbag things on the seat belt. Am I right, Kevin? I think that's what that is. So thanks, Kevin, for showing that to me. Oh, excuse me again. Uh, Bruno from Portugal writes, uh, have, let's see. I'd like to thank you for your excelente podcast. Thank you. I am from Madeira Island in Portugal, and you might have seen a few videos of Funchal Funchal, uh, Airport in Madeira. Below, there is a link to one of the videos. And I looked at that video, and it's amazing to watch people trying to land on it. He said, once one of the world's most dangerous airports due due to its short runway and proximity to cliffs. The runway was extended in the 1980s after 131 people were killed when a Boeing 727 plunged off the end of the runway on landing. Ooh. It was extended again in 2000, and today almost half of the runway consists of an extension that is supported by more than 150 concrete pillars. However, the airport's proximity to mountains and the sea and subsequent risk of extreme turbulence and poor weather conditions means landing here still represents or presents a problem for even the most experienced pilots. And so in this video, it shows many, many people coming in, uh, approaching or or attempting landing on this runway. Many of them go around, and one or two of them in the video actually make it and land. So it looks very, very precarious and very dangerous. Uh, let's see. He also sent a um, video of a Ryanair flight from Stansted, UK to Porto, Portugal. And the uh, people remained on the plane for over eight hours on the ground. And um, I, th- I shared this um, several weeks ago when uh, Bruno sent this to me. He sent this to me on February 21st. And I, I posted it and shared it on my Airline Pilot Guy page. That's facebook.com slash airline pilot guy. And uh, there was a good discussion about that. But um, it's an interesting video, a passenger taking the video. And essentially, the uh, passengers were held hostage on that airplane for, for eight hours. They actually had to call the police to come and rescue them. And uh, anyway, if you want to check out that video, I'll have the link in the show notes. And you can also do a search for it on my Facebook page, Airline Pilot Guy, and you can see the discussion that was had uh, there. Anyway, very, very interesting, and in a lot of ways, very disappointing. Uh, Jen writes, uh, Jen Chapman, Hi, Airline Pilot Guy. I found this post on Reddit, R-E-D-D-I-T. It's from a bush pilot in Africa who recently crashed his plane and is holding a fundraiser to replace it. I thought you may, uh, maybe you could put the word out there to your listeners. And I'm going to click on this link right now and see if this fundraiser is still, yep, 24 days are left. It's a ver- uh, a verified nonprofit. Um, it is um, on Indiegogo, a fundraising uh, project, and they're looking for $200,000, and so far they only have $4,872. Um not looking very good right now for this fundraiser to uh, get some money to replace this airplane, I guess, that crashed. Um, flying Medical Service in Tanzania. Uh, we provide regular preventive and curative health care and air transport for medical emergencies in Tanzania. We recently lost our plane in an accident. And the Flying Medical Service is a... Uh, United States nonprofit, strictly volunteer organization, which provides regular preventative and curative health care, mostly for the Maasai people, air transport, poor medical emergencies, as well as health education services. Uh, they've been based at the Arusha Airport in Tanzania since 1983. 
We provide our services for people throughout the region regardless of religious, religious affiliation, ethnic background, or ability to pay immediately. We work in, a, in remote areas that are far from regular health care facilities. They said they, we, they recently had an accident uh, while performing medical outreach in the Tanzanian bush. Without an aircraft, we can't provide emergency flights or clinical services. Since insurance for this type of flying we do is prohibitive, prohibitive, we need to raise the money in order to purchase another one. Okay, so I'm going to have a link to that in the show notes. If you are so compelled to read more, find out more about the flying medical service in Tanzania and want to help them with their fundraising goal, um, check it out. Again, they're looking for $200,000. They have 24 days left. And right now, they just have under $5,000 raised so far. So thank you, Jen, for pointing that out to me. I do appreciate it. Hello, Captain Jeff. My name is Emma, and I'm a listener from Australia. I must live under some sort of a rock, as I've only just discovered your podcast, but the upside is that I have a hundred episodes to get through, so it will be a while before I run out. Yes, it will. <laughs> be a long while, Emma. Uh, your podcast is awesome, but I can't make too many comments or give much feedback, as I'm still back on episode six, so I'll have to hurry and catch up. But I have a bit of a babble with a question towards the end, so if you don't actually want to wade through this big wall of text, just skip to the end. No, I want to wade through this big ball of text. This babble, <laughs> Emma. My fascination with planes came about from a fear of flying, which probably sounds strange. As a child, the concept of flight seemed so illogical. How could a big, heavy thing stay in the air like that? So planes had great power, and I viewed them with a lot of awe and respect from the ground. I traveled domestically on planes occasionally uh, when there were little other choices, but hated it and suffered panic attacks for hours beforehand, as well as during the flight. Every bump or noise had me convinced the metal tube I was stuck in was about to fall from the sky. It, wasn't, it also wasn't much fun for my travel companions. In my early teens, an opportunity came up to take a trip overseas for school, and although the thought of international plane travel terrified me, I didn't want to miss out. My mom took me to see one of her friends, who was a captain for a major Australian airline, and he sat, me with, sat with me for hours explaining in great detail how an airplane work, worked, how it stayed in the sky, what happened if the engines failed, in hindsight, I think he left out some of the details about how planes can crash in many other ways. What some of the strange noises were that I would hear, and some technical details on turbulence. Despite some white knuckles on takeoff, I survived that flight, and even almost enjoyed it. The best bit was, as this was pre-9-11, I got to go into the cockpit during the flight and see the world, well, the sky and the clouds, in a way not many people get to see it. Anyway, this is getting long, and you're probably wondering what my point is. My point is I love planes. I love flying as a passenger, and I love all things aviation. A medical condition keeps me away from a career in the air, but what makes planes work and what makes planes stop working is my area of interest. At the very start of your podcast, you mentioned you had training and experience in aviation accident and incident investigation, which is an area of the aviation industry I'd like to end up in. I know Australia is different from the U.S., but would you have any advice for someone who cannot gain experience by joining the military but wanted to consider aiming for a career in aviation safety or accident investigation? Or does a lack of practical flying experience make that a silly, silly idea? even if doing study in a related field. Anyway, if you read this uh, if you read this far or if you read this far, you deserve a cookie. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Keep up the good work and fly safely. Now, Emma, I don't see where there is a cookie that you included with your communication to me. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> and no, don't you dare think about sending me a cookie from Australia. That would be way too expensive. Okay. So first of all, thanks, Emma, for listening. Uh, welcome aboard the Airline Pilot Guy community. And 
do I have advice? And, and, and what you're proposing and um, you know interested in doing, I, I don't think is really that unusual. Um, in fact, I just received an email not too long ago. I probably shouldn't look for it right while I'm recording this show, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to see if I can find it for you. Um, but in the meantime, I'll continue talking. I'm going to start up my email program. But I received something from the National Transportation Safety Board here in the United States that was advertising um, some courses that you can take. Uh, they're, they're not cheap. I um, believe around $3,000 to take an accident investigation course, but I would imagine that that would give you the qualifications necessary to actually exercise that uh that ability that, um, you know, to be an accident investigator. Let me see here. I'm going to go ahead and type in NTSB. I get these notices occasionally, and I'm seeing if I can find that particular one. This is fascinating, isn't it? Hmm... Well, you know what? I can't find it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, I'm going to find it, and I'm going to put a link in the show notes, unless I forget, but I'm sure somebody out there will remind me or, uh, you know, help me with this. Uh, but my point is that uh, the NTSB here in the U.S. offers these uh, investigation courses, uh, and I'm sure that the um, the similar uh, agency over in Australia, whatever that's called, probably the Australian Transportation Safety Board or whatever, uh, maybe they offer some kind of training uh, courses or seminars or that kind of thing. Uh, I received my accident investigation training from uh, the University of Southern California while I was in the Air Force. They uh, maintained a an accident and safety uh, school at uh, Norton Air Force Base, which is now closed. Uh, but uh, the um, University of Southern California, USC, still offers this uh, curriculum and training, and I'm sure that there must be uh, in the great continent of, and country of Australia some kind of a university or some somebody out there offering aircraft investigation schools and courses and that kind of thing. And I would definitely pursue it if you have an interest in it. Uh, perhaps uh, somebody listening from down under might have some information about where you might go, Emma, to pursue your uh, interest in a career in aircraft accident investigation and safety. I am absolutely sure that there's something down there for you to participate in in some way. So uh, good luck. I know you're not going to hear the answer to this question uh, for some time if you're only on episode number six. So um Maybe if I get a chance, I'll, I'll um, write, reply to you so you can get that reply a little sooner. So thanks again for listening, Miss Emma from Australia. Chris writes, um, hey, my name is Chris. Okay, I recently got a job with a regional. My long-term goal is to fly for a major. I was wondering if you could maybe give me some pointers on how to get to the majors and maybe kind of explain the path you took. I did the civilian way after school started flying caravans part 135 and have recently got enough time to move up to the regionals. It's a hard road, and any pointer would be much appreciated. Okay, Chris, it is a hard road, but if you uh, have the determination and the will uh, to get to the majors, you will. I'm sure of it. And uh, as I mentioned did I mention, yeah, earlier on this show, uh, flying with the jump seater Andy, um, who also flies uh, caravans, except for I think his is a, is it a 121 operation, I think? Or maybe it's a 135 operation as well. Anyway, he's trying to get some uh, multi-engine time. I think he needs 50 hours to uh, qualify to um, get an interview with the regional airlines. And so he's kind of on that same road. And... Um, Let's see, tips and advice. Well, just keep working hard. Um, don't make any mistakes. Or if you do make a mistake, make sure that they're small ones. 
Um, keep your health up and keep optimistic and positive about uh, your flying career and uh, just, you know, uh, be happy and um, be positive and professional in everything you do, whether somebody's watching you or not. Always strive to be the most professional uh, pilot that you can be. And uh, again, as I said, I'm sure that you're going to make it. Yeah, this is a good time, uh, a good time for people like you. I mean, you have a head start on a lot of people out there who are thinking about getting into this business. So uh, good luck, Chris. Please let us know how your journey uh, proceeds, okay? Okay, this is from um, Israel. In, uh, he calls himself Brazilian Israel from Greenville. Hope this email finds you well. I'm sending you this email not as a feedback question for the show per se, but to ask you a technical question and give you a few suggestions. Okay, so he talks about um, some of the technical aspects of how I'm doing the show, and, um, and, and he's suggesting that I maybe have a, a page on my website where I can kind of list the equipment that I'm using to do the podcast. And, uh, and I love this stuff, and I, I know many of you could care less about the camera that I'm using and the microphone I'm using and the video, I mean, the audio recording system and apps that I'm using on my laptop and all that kind of stuff. And I understand that this is an aviation show and it's not a podcasting show, although I'd love to do a podcasting show, but there are a lot of great ones out there. My favorite is uh, Cliff Ravenscraft, um, Podcast Answer Man. Uh, so, um, Brazilian Israel, if you haven't started listening to Cliff Ravenscraft's um, podcast, Answer Man podcast, I'd do that immediately. Put that in your list of podcasts to listen to. But I think it's a great idea. I, I will definitely do that. Right now, we're uh, Arash, uh, the guy that's basically in charge of my website, has been suggesting some cool um, ideas, uh, enhancements to the site. And uh, so uh, look forward to talking about that in the future. And uh, perhaps one of those things will be um, a page where I can talk about this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, he's talking about the fa fact that uh, the website is kind of slow to load occasionally. And I think that's because I'm using um, uh, shared hosting, uh, sh shared virtual hosting. Um, and... I'm, I'm probably going to be changing that as well. Arash has convinced me that we need to go to a dedicated server, which is going to be more expensive. But, hey, I have a coffee fund, and I'm sure that uh, people will will be happy to send me some money for my coffee. By the way, I'm drinking my coffee right now. Mm. It's excellent, by the way. And uh, I'm drinking it with my Acme Airlines coffee mug. You want a coffee mug that says Acme Airlines or a t-shirt that says Acme Airlines? Look forward to uh, maybe doing something like that in the future um, if you're interested. Okay, um, let's see. Let me get down to what he wanted to say. Oh, uh, he says, I love listening to your show. It's great, but it gets a little old. When listeners send the same questions over and over, and because you're so nice to your listeners, you have to repeat the questions and answers that have been previously discussed. I know it's easier said than done, but maybe a FAQ section, a frequently asked questions section on your website would help with some of these questions. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of people have suggested that, Israel. And honestly, I think it would help a little bit. But I don't think it's going to take care of the, the, the big problem with that because a lot of people, like right now, somebody may be listening to the show for the very first time and doesn't realize that this question that they're asking has already been asked and um, uh, they don't bother to go back and, and listen to any of the earlier episodes. So um, you're right, though. I know that uh, you longtime listeners kind of get tired. It's kind of tedious to listen to the same old thing over and over again, and I'm going to do um, a better job of trying to not continually answering, you know, answering the or, or answer the same question over and over again. So uh, bear with me as I figure out how to do this the best way I can. And uh, he's at the end here says, "I look forward to being on your 
Acme flight one of these days. I have a trip to Brazil coming up, so I will have domestic flights between Raleigh-Durham and Atlanta and Atlanta-Raleigh-Durham on April 12th and May 4th, respectively. You should totally bid for those routes so I can meet you and have you sign my passenger flight logbook. <laughs> Laugh out loud, he says. Take care. Um, thank you, Brazilian Israel, and uh, thank you for your uh, very helpful, constructive critiques. And uh, I'll def definitely take all that in con into consideration. You have a lot of great ideas. As far as um, bidding for Raleigh-Durham Atlanta and Atlanta-Raleigh-Durham, I don't know about that, but I'll, I'll see. I'll take a look at it, okay? Uh, you never know when I might be on your jet. All right. Let's uh, continue moving on with your feedback. Nate from Cape Cod asks, I was wondering what your opinion was on flying for the military. After your eight-year commitment, how many hours would you generally end up with? And also, what is the best way to build flight time when you're only 16 years old and you don't have a lot of money? Um, and then he asked me if I knew somebody and gave me a... No, I don't know Richard Johnson. But... I'm sure he's a wonderful person. Um, what is my opinion on flying for the military? I think flying for the military is great. Uh, fantastic training, great experience, high quality people, great um, pay and benefits. Uh, it's, a, it's a good place to be. And uh, I've met very, very, a huge number of very high quality people um, from my military experience. And you say eight years uh, commitment. I think now it's more than eight years. I think it's 10 years. And then you have to uh, add on the extra year or so of pilot training. And then if you're not an officer, a little bit extra time for that. So, you know, you're looking at 11 to 12 years of commitment. That's the downside. You know, if you want to get hired by the, if you want to do airline flying, um, then uh, if you fly in the military, I would recommend, strongly recommend, that you try to get a job with a uh, National Guard unit or an Air Force Reserve unit and see if you can get on with them and get a pilot slot. And that way, uh, you still have a commitment, but it's not uh, the same kind of commitment you have in, on active duty. Uh, so, for instance, um, if you... Uh, if you go through their, go through pilot training and you affiliate yourself with a reserve or guard unit and uh, then a couple of years after flying for that unit, you get hired by a regional or a major airline, you can still do, uh, f you know, fulfill your reserve or guard commitment simultaneously with flying in the uh, regionals or the majors. And uh, it's, uh, I think that's the way to go. Um, if you started like right now and got into the military and, you know, 12 years from now, I don't know, maybe, maybe things are going to be going like gangbusters then too. I mean, it's, I certainly wouldn't rule it out and the, the experience would be fantastic. Uh, as far as the number of hours you get, well, I can only tell you what I got when I went through the military and my commitment was six years. And after, uh, three months of learning how to be an officer and uh, being commissioned as a second lieutenant, going through pilot training for another year, and then actively flying for six years after that point, uh, C-141s and T-37s, I ended up with a grand total of about just a little over 2,000 hours of flying time. And some people actually you know, had less than that, some more, depending on what type of airplane they were flying. So you don't get a heck of a lot of flying time, but the airlines take that in consideration. If you're in the military and you're flying a uh, F-15 or F-16 or F-22 or F-35 or whatever it is nowadays that you're going to fly like a fighter, uh, the, the, um, the airlines understand that you're only logging you know, a little over an hour each, each sortie, and it takes a long time to build up time that way. Uh, on the other hand, if you're flying the C-17 or the C-5 or the uh, one of the tankers or the bombers, uh, your your flights might be longer in duration, so you may end up with more hours that way. So 
it's all taken into consideration. And when the what the airlines do when they look at military time, they know that you received top notch training, and they know that the quality of your experience that you've received in the military um, counts for something. So, wouldn't worry about you know the number of hours that you that you log in the military. Um, yeah, what do you do when you're only 16 and you don't have a lot of money? <laughs> Try to get a job in the military. Go look for that reserve unit or National Guard unit that is a flying unit and uh, try to uh, get them to put you through pilot training and officer officer training school or officer candidate school, whatever they're calling it now. Uh, definitely recommend doing that if you can. All right. Thank you for your question, Nate, from Kate Codd. Uh, Theonor, Theonor, I always have trouble pronouncing your name. I'm sorry. Um, this is from, uh, first officer Theonar from Acme, Middle East, Dubai. Uh, he just listened to my latest podcast titled the Ethiopian Hi- airline hijack story. Um, love it as usual, especially, especially the first 30 minutes. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, just had a manual handling sim the other day and something came up with all these precise altimeter primary flight displays, etc. even a 100 foot altitude deviation is noticeable or a 10 degrees heading deviation isn't it more challenging to pass all these now than let's say back in the 70s how can you even tell uh, of a 10 degrees heading deviation using those those old dials rotating needles etc while my n1 is at 22.5 percent question mark the other day a captain was nagging me because i had 163 knots in the speed window on purpose instead of 160 what the F, right? But I gave him a piece of my mind. <laughs> anyway, just thought it would be an interesting thing to talk about. But then again, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, no, it is an interesting thing to talk about. I hadn't thought about the fact that the primary flight displays that we're using now, the modern flight displays, uh, yeah, they're kind of expanded. You know, the the uh, the airspeed and the altitudes and the headings are, you know, it used to be very, very small. In fact, what I'm looking at, what I'm used to looking at right now is quite small scale, but these big giant flat panel displays they have now with the magnification of the, uh, of the heading and everything else, I would imagine. I don't know. I've not, um, I've not flown an airplane with those displays. I don't know if it's harder now to, um, to maintain altitude and headings and stuff when you're manually flying. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, maybe somebody else out there with experience uh, with the old steam gauges and the new uh, fancy flat panel displays with the magnified headings and altitudes could uh, chime in on that as far as accuracy when hand flying. Uh, Great question, by the way, Theonar. So uh, I appreciate your feedback and support and look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Now, finally, I have some audio feedback. Yay! So let's listen to... Fred, the pilot. Hey, Jeff. Fred, the pilot. I've been listening to your show now for quite some time, probably back since uh, mid-'80s episodes. I have to say, I really enjoy them, and you do a very nice job, both on uh, content and uh, the quality of your podcasts are uh, top-notch. So, at any rate, something kind of funny. You were talking on the last episode, I think it was like 107, and somebody had asked you questions about... Uh, you know, conditions in the cockpit, temperaments, whatnot. And uh, you were talking about how you deal with guys that want to complain and, and bring the crew down a lot. And I just had something funny. I work for a, uh, I'm a captain for a large legacy fractional provider here in the U.S. I've been flying professionally about 21 years. But the um, years ago, the company I worked for, we merged with another company. And as you can imagine, whenever you have mergers, you're going to have some people that go, well, It happens. And other people that just want to complain about it. So a technique that a friend of mine used and I have adopted, which uh, come to find out was quite effective to uh, put down some of the complaining and whining, was uh, effectively what he would do is the minute the person, the first time the person would start to complain on the trip, he would say, well, stop, wait a minute. Okay, here's the way it works. You get 30 minutes this week to complain. Now you can use it all up at once, or you can use it in five-minute increments. 
If you don't use the full five-minute increment, I'm going to round it to the next nearest five-minute increment. So use it as you wish, but every time you complain, we're going to log the time and you get 30 minutes. Now, what this did with most people was they got a good chuckle out of it and realized that, you know, listen, he wasn't interested in listening to them complain the whole time. And it pretty much put a squash to it. And uh, and I, I had adopted it and, and had the same results. I haven't had to implement that in quite a few years uh, because uh, everything's pretty much been status quo. But uh, there's some things going on. We've purchased another company, and I'm sure it's all going to start over again. So I'll be pulling that little trick back out of the bag. So anyway, right, I just thought you might find that entertaining and useful. <laughs> um, well, anyway, right, keep up the great work. Um, really enjoy the show, and you can. I'm actually doing a thing on YouTube. You might want to check out. It's uh, Fred the Pilot on YouTube doing stuff about more corporate aviation but uh all right take care god bless uh, we'll see you later well thank you fred the pilot and uh of course you knew that i was going to go over to fred the pilot on the youtube on the youtubes and uh check out your show and i did and I'm very impressed uh with what you're doing fred and i think it's great uh that you are putting something out there with the perspective that you have flying for the fractional uh business jet um aspect of our uh, field of aviation. And I'm learning a lot from you and your show and uh, very, very high quality stuff from you as well. So I'm going to have um, a link in the show notes to Fred the Pilot's uh, channel on YouTube. And looks like right now, I'm looking at your channel right now, you have six episodes so far. Um, let's see, I've only, I have to admit, I've only watched your first episode when he was in his car. And uh, but he has some episodes about uh, let's see flightplan.com, ATC, EDCT, and root. Uh, let's see the number four uh, snow to work. Uh, number five weekly roundup. Number six he has another week on the road. And so again, as I said, he um, he talks about um, aviation and uh, prof- being a professional pilot. For his particular slice of the um, of the aviation pie, which is uh, corporate flying, business business jet flying, and uh, very interesting, highly recommend Fred the pilot. Again, check it out in the show notes. Thanks, Fred, for uh, your compliments and uh, sending in the feedback. And as far as uh, you know, attitudes in the cockpit. Um, yeah, when things when things are going well, for the most part. Uh, the cockpit conversation is positive. However, I'm sure that you've met those people that uh, regardless of how good things, how things, how well things are going, they're still complaining. And, oh man, that's just tedious. But as I mentioned in an earlier episode, that's one of the nice things about being a captain uh, or aircraft commander or whatever you want to call it. Um, You don't have to put up with that kind of attitude and atmosphere in your cockpit. Uh, you can basically squelch that. I, I like that idea that that guy had where he uh, said, oh, okay, you have 30 minutes to use during the week with negative comments, and after that, that's it. <laughs> Makes the point, doesn't it? All right. Marion writes, uh, just recently, recently discovered your podcast and have found and have... Uh, blah, 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 blah. That's not what Marion said. That's me. Okay, let me start again. I just recently discovered your podcast, and I found that your episodes are very enlightening. In episode 102, you pointed out a few helpful tips for airline interviews. I was wondering if you can offer your thoughts on this scenario. A pilot is invited to an airline interview, and the only difference in in his qualifications versus other applicants is that this pilot has a first-class medical with a waiver due to a health condition. The condition in question was evaluated by the licensing authority, FAA, CAA, etc., and it was determined that it would not adversely affect his ability to safely fly an aircraft as a commercial pilot. Would a pilot in this situation be overlooked for the job based on these circumstances? On that note, do pilots at your airline ever worry about taking medicals in the event that they may lose their jobs? Regards, Marion. Well, well, let me answer that last one first. On that note, do pilots at your airline ever worry about taking medicals? 
Well, you know, I'm sure that there are. I mean, you know, that you have to have a medical, a valid medical certificate to exercise the privilege of airline transport pilot flying. So I guess it depends on your health and maybe your mental attitude. I'm sure that there are pilots out there that worry about everything. Uh, I'm sure that there might be some people that don't worry about much but know that their health perhaps is um, is deteriorating or some, some aspect of their health is possibly a problem, and then I could see them worrying about taking a medical examination. Um, so yes, I, I'm sure that there are some, that, but we have to because... Um, uh, I have to take a, uh, a medical examination every six months to exercise my uh, my my certificate. Um, yeah, that's about all I can say about that. Um, I don't worry about it. I figure that if there's something that keeps me from getting my first class medical certificate, it's probably pretty serious and something that I need to know anyway and take care of. So uh, that's my attitude. Um, the part about being interviewed and the person has a first class medical with a waiver due to a health condition i can only speak for the way things were back when i was interviewing uh, a little more than 25 years ago each airline that i went to for an interview had their own medical examination so regardless if you came in with a first class medical with a waiver or a first-class medical certificate with no waiver, uh, or a military, you know, flight surgeon, what, whatever. It didn't matter because they were going to uh, either in-house, like American Airlines had their own medical uh, uh, interview or screening thing set up, or uh, if you were like uh, Delta Airlines, they sent um, the prospective uh, pilots over to a contracted facility to do. Uh, the necessary evaluation, and um, you know, it, it involved um, eye examinations and uh, treadmill tests and glu- you know, blood sugar, glucose tests, and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that they, uh, the individual airlines, kind of do their own analysis of a person's health, and uh, and and go from there. So I'm not really sure. Of course, that may be different now. Maybe airlines now rely upon uh, FAA-designated examiners, uh, medical examiners, to uh, to do their job properly, and they just uh, figure that if you have a first-class medical certificate, whether it has waivers or not, that you're you know you're good to go. I don't know. Uh, I really don't have a definitive answer on that, Marianne. Uh, really don't. So uh, again, perhaps one of my listeners can chime in with uh, some more. Uh, a better answer than what I just gave, but uh, uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I would just continue to do what I can do, build up those hours, keep your health um, as as good or up as good or as well as you can, and have a positive mental attitude. I think that's a big part of it. All right, I'm looking at the clock. That means that uh, I need to stop again because I want to make sure that I have enough time to change and drive over to uh, the place where my daughter's um, uh, ballet performance is. So I'm going to pause the show once again and then resume recording uh, probably tonight and uh, hopefully have this thing out tonight. So until then, hang in there. I'm back again and uh, went to my daughter's um, uh, ballet performance and she was just beautiful, great dancer and uh, a proud father. So um, it's getting late in the evening again, but uh, hopefully I don't appear or sound too tired and I am, I am, um, I'm something determined. That's it. Determined to finish this episode. (laughs) So let's start by playing this.
Okay, this episode's installment of Nick Carson and some questions. Thanks, Nick, for your um, for your feedback and questions. Uh, my father was checking standby flights on Acme from Las Vegas, McCarran to Atlanta, and he found a flight that uh, doing that route, which was a Boeing 767-300 that had 237 open seats on it. Therefore, what is the lowest amount of passengers that you have carried? This doesn't include ferry flights. And uh, just a reminder to you who... I uh, don't understand what the term ferry flight means. That means when we're, we're flying an airplane empty, uh, void of passengers, and usually void of uh, flight attendants as well. Uh, so thinking back, I believe one night we were flying from Atlanta to Albany, New York, and then we had a continuing service from Albany to Portland, Maine. And... It was a pretty light flight to begin with from Atlanta to Albany, New York. I think we may have had 30 passengers, something like that. This is back on the 727, uh, which uh, in our com- configuration held 149 passengers. And so 29 of those 30, let's say, got off the airplane. And yes, we had one passenger from Albany, New York to Portland, Maine. And uh, that was kind of interesting. I actually went back and briefed, uh, gave my PA to that passenger in person before we took off. So that was kind of fun. Uh, let's see. Would you would like to make a quick comment regarding Tom's feedback on taking note of tail numbers of planes he's flown on? For my flying experience on various airlines, I always try to capture the tail number of the plane that, I, that I'm about to or just have flown on just for the sake of just it. I, too, like to enter every once in a while to see where it is flown or um, going to fly to. Just for an example, I was flying Phoenix to Las Vegas on a U.S. Airways Boeing 737-300 that just plain out empty and did this amazing steep... Oh, it was just plain empty and did this amazing steep takeoff, so after landing and disembarking the airplane, I went over to check the tail number of it, uh, November 155AW, if you're interested. Uh, After coming back from the trip, I entered it and got all kinds of info on it, like uh, back in January of 1995, it had four uncommanded rolls to the right, but thankfully didn't crash. So that's my two cents on that. Thanks, and looking forward to your intake on this. I think you. I think he means take on that. Um, yeah, I guess that's a, a legitimate reason to... Uh, I mean, I don't see anything wrong with keeping track of uh, tail numbers and flights and stuff like that. That's just kind of like a personal journal and, yeah, no problem with that, Nick. Um, finally, when I was flying the MD-88 from Houston to Atlanta several times... Uh, when the flight was coming in to land on runway 27 left, just on downwind of the approach, the plane would descend sharply and start turning on a base and finally final and land. So I will always wondered, why does the plane do the sharp descent on downwind? Well, that doesn't always happen, Nick, but perhaps this flight that you're usually flying on is coming in at a time of day in Atlanta where it's not very busy. And if you're coming in from the west, uh, as you would be coming in from Houston, uh, you'd be coming through the southwestern um, gate uh, to land. And if they're landing to the west uh, and and there's uh, the, the visibility is good, so they're running visual approaches, um, chances are they're going to want you to rapidly descend so that you can get down to the appropriate altitude so they can bring you on a base leg and final coming in. And the reason they do that, especially on the south side, is that the north side arrivals are usually at a up at a higher altitude, and they want you to get down below that altitude so that when you have two airplanes coming in, one from the north, one from the south, and kind of converging um, to the parallel runways, they want some vertical separation there. So that's why... That's one reason why they'd have you uh, descend very quickly. And uh, the faster you can get down, the uh, the less amount of distance you'll have to travel 
to the east of the airport before you turn around. So it saves time. It helps with sequencing for the uh, controlling facility, and it helps us. It uh, saves fuel and gets uh, the airplane on the ground faster, which means that you're going to arrive at the gate a little bit faster. So it's a win-win-win for everybody. So that's the reason why. Thanks, Nick, for your questions, as always. Hey, you helicopter guys out there, guys and gals. Uh, the NTSB is issuing two safety alerts focusing on improving helicopter safety. Uh, this year, safety was helicopter safety was added to the NTSB's most wanted list of safety improvements. In the past decade, over 1,500 accidents have occurred involving helicopters used as air ambulances for search and rescue missions, commercial helicopter operations such as tour flights, and instructional operations. During that same time, the NTSB issued over 200 safety recommendations on issues related to helicopter investigations. Implementing recommended safety improvements that address helicopter operations can mitigate risk for thousands of pilots and passengers each year, says Deborah Herzman, the NTSB chairman, at this week's Heli Expo. That was back on February 25th when this came out. Uh, we are working with HAI to increase awareness and, and identify voluntary action taken by key stakeholders to improve the safety of helicopter operations. The two safety alerts issued today, back on February 25th, are safety through helicopter simulators and helicopter safety starts in the hangar. So I'll have a couple uh, links there if you're interested especially if you're uh, one of the couple of people listening to the show who are helicopter drivers. It might be of interest to you. Uh, let's see. This from my friend Chris up in Hartford, Connecticut. He says, check out this episode of The Air Adventures of Jimmy Allen, episode 0417. It is in the public domain, as it is an old-time radio show from 1936-37. They talk about the new autopilot system. It's pretty funny, because a lot of the same stuff is still said today. So let's take a listen to a little bit of The Air Adventures of Jimmy Allen. Wonderful to be true. And look at all the instruments and switches and gadgets in this cockpit. I don't think an ocean liner has more dials than the grid. Quite a few things to look at for, all right. You think you can manage it? Oh, gosh. This bus has everything. Well, it isn't nearly as complicated as it looks. But I'll tell you, kid, this job has every modern device known to air transportation. Believe me, they're getting these airplanes now so that they're safer to fly in than riding a bicycle. There's one thing for sure. You couldn't get another instrument in this cockpit even if you had one. Hey, what's this black box that sits down there between the two control wheels? Oh, can't you get it? Now, let's see. Oh, sure, I know. That's the new automatic pilot we've heard so much about. That's right. It's the autopilot, or what the newspapers like to call the robot pilot. And that little black box will actually fly this big ship? I'll say it will. Fly it smoother, easier, and more accurately than you or I can. It's practically human. You mean that we can sit up here with our hands and our feet off the controls, and it will fly the ship? Absolutely. After you set your autopilot, you don't have to touch the controls. Oh, gosh, that's wonderful. But how in the world does it work? And it works on a gyroscopic principle, which is rather complicated to explain. But after we come down from this head top, I'll get out a diagram and go over it with you. Uh, is it working? Oh, sure. All you have to do is push this lever, just like that. Well, I'll be happy. Here, kid. I'll explain briefly how you operate it. And then after we take off, we'll see how it works. Fine. Oh, but you can't take off or land with it, can you? No, it hasn't been developed at that stage yet. However, engineers are working on that angle right now. 
There's no doubt that what in a few years this autopilot will be so perfected that it'll take off and land the ship just as easily as it now flies one in the air. Just think of that. Just think of that. I um, edited, and I tried to clean it up as much as I could, but it is an old-time radio show and a lot of static, and uh, it may have been hard for you to hear everything. I'll have a link to the uh, that episode in the show notes, and you can listen to it yourself. Uh, but um, interesting, you know, an airplane with this newfangled new autopilot. Robot pilot, the newspapers are calling it. And uh, golly, <laughs> thanks, uh, Chris, for... Uh, Sending that, and that kind of um, uh, transitions nicely to um, some feedback that I received from Derek. He says, as an aviation enthusiast, not a pilot, a curiosity of mine was uh, has surrounded ILS approaches, and specifically Category 3. In poor weather, especially very low visibility, when does a pilot decide to set up for the Cat 3 versus diverting? Is the decision based on airline policy, pilot comfort with the weather, and the minimums for a Cat 3 approach, special endorsements, or training required? I often, a weird hobby, listen to the, that's not a weird hobby, listen to the ATC streams on liveatc.net, principally at BWI, Baltimore, Washington International, since I have the most familiar familiarity with that airport. Often, when pilots check in with the tower, they will identify the ILS approach even though most air traffic is coming in visual. Is there a reason? Also, in poor weather, low cloud decks, fog, heavy thunderstorms, and poor RVRs, most flights will divert or go around while some get in on the first attempt without a reported change in conditions. Are they all using Category 3 Autoland? It seems that Southwest, which has most of BWI's ops, always divert. What is your view and experience on these approaches? I apologize. This is long-winded. Thanks. No, not at all, Derek. That's a a normal length question you have there. Um, Okay. Well, you know, again, I'm going to have to just uh, make some suppositions. Uh, But we can first talk about your first question. Um... You said, in poor weather, especially very low visibility, when does a pilot decide to set up for the Cat 3 versus diverting? Um, Well, uh, first of all, you know, each airliner uh, is is equipped with a certain level of automation. Um, Most airline fleets are equipped with the Category 3 landing system, but not all. There are some airlines out there that um, that don't use Category 3. They're only certified to Category 2 or Category 1. And I do apologize for the, uh, the water feature. I don't know if you can hear that or not, so I'll keep talking. We'll just pretend we don't hear that upstairs. Um, and so it depends on the, um, the equipment on the airplane. Um, and some, some airlines order... Uh, Autoland systems based upon uh, what what they think that the airline operation is going to encounter. Uh, they weigh it against how much money it will cost to maintain the status of the uh, Autoland system, and of course the extra training required because the crew has to be trained and qualified to uh, participate in the Category Three or Category 2 landings. Um, The airplane has to have have the equipment, as I said, and it has to be maintained, and it has to be checked and certified every so often, uh, basically every 90 days, I believe. And uh, the airport itself, um, not all airports, even some of the big ones, uh, some of the runways don't have Category 3 or Category 2. They're just Category 1 runways. So it all depends on the equipment, available to shoot the approach at that particular airport and that particular runway, the airplane, what it's equipped with, and if the crew is certified to uh, to fly that approach. Now, if the, if the fleet is equipped with a Category 3 system, I'll guarantee that all the crews are certified to fly that because that's just something they do. Um, 
So that's one consideration when you're coming in for an approach. So when you're listening to the automatic terminal information service and they say that, you know, the uh, well, they'll say, they'll say an ILS approach is in effect. They won't say what category. Uh, but then you'll hear the weather and if the visibility, if they're using RVR readings, if they say runway 27 left RVR, uh, 4,000, uh, you know, ne- uh, let's see, approach 400, um, mid 400, and uh, far end, I'm probably using the wrong terms here, but if they use the RVR readings and they're particularly low, then you know that it's time to set up for the lowest, uh, for the, the, the most advanced category of ILS that is applicable for that runway and the airplane you're flying. And in most cases, it's going to be a Category 3. So let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, the uh, different categories of instrument landing system approaches, ILS. Category 1 will take you down to a decision height uh, which is the minimum above runway threshold or touchdown zone of 200 feet, 61 meters. And uh, the runway visual range, or RVR, is 550 meters or 2,400 feet. 1,200 is approved at some airports. And um, it is increased to 800 meters for single crew operations. Um, the visibility minimum is 800 meters or... 1,600 or 1,200 feet, uh, depending on whether you're in the U.S. or Canada. And uh, let's see, Category 2 will bring you down to a 100-foot decision height, or 30 meters, and the visibility drops down to 300 meters or 1,000 feet. And uh, Category 3, now Category 3 has three different subcategories. There's Category 3A, 3B, and 3C. 3A will take you down to uh, either a decision or alert height of 50 to 100 feet, which is 15 to 30 meters. Uh, Visibility required there, 200 meters, or basically RVR 700. Category 3B uh, uses a... uh, something between 0 and 50 feet for an alert height and 75 meters uh, or 300 RVR. And then a Category 3 C, uh, there is no height above touchdown, decision height or alert height. Uh, There is no RVR requirement and uh, no visibility minimum. Uh, As of 2012, this category is not yet in operation anywhere in the world as it requires guidance to taxi and zero visibility as well. Uh, So uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier on the show. Uh, The the Lockheed TriStar was certified to fly Category 3C, but as I mentioned, uh, only for a short period of time were there airport facilities that um, had the capability of supporting Category 3C. So right now, the lowest minimum is Category 3B, Uh, So back to your question, Derek, uh, why is it that some airlines or airliners get in and some don't? A couple different reasons. One may be that uh, the visibility is dynamic, where uh, one airplane coming in on their approach may uh, encounter an RVR reading that is above the minimum, uh, or and they land, and then another airplane coming in a little bit later, uh, the visibility has dropped down below the required minimum and they have to go around and divert. That's one scenario. The other is that it's possible that the airplanes getting in might be uh, 757s, 767s, 777s, and I'm assuming the 787 as well, and perhaps the 747. Many of those airplanes are certified down to Category 3B, and they have an alert height which means that they don't really need to see anything, but uh, they at that height they get an alert that they're 50 feet above touchdown or whatever. And so they can usually land in much lower uh, visibility conditions than a Category 3A airplane. Uh, the airplane that I fly, um, the MD-88, MD-90, is a Category 3A. We have a 50-foot decision height, not an alert height. We have to see something at 50 by 50 feet 
above touchdown. If we don't, then we have to go around. Um, again, um, airplanes like the 88, uh, the Mad Dogs, uh, the 737s, um, et cetera, have the, have the system, or, um, the Category 3A uh, certification where you have the 50-foot decision height. So there are all kinds of different uh, combinations there. I believe the Airbuses have uh, Category 3B systems with alert heights and uh, really don't need to see much in land. So again, it might have something to do with the airplane, uh, the airline, and how their fleet is equipped. Uh, all right. I know I'm probably confusing matters here, but uh, uh, let's see. Looking at Acme's Approach Minima Category 3 table, um, in our fleet, the Boeing 717, Boeing 737, and MD-8890, uh, we can uh, we use a 50-foot decision height um, for Category 3A, uh, uh, RVR lowest minimum 600, um, and we do have some airplanes that have 100-foot alert heights, the uh, Airbus 319, 320, A330, and the Boeing 747. And we have uh, some airplanes with a 50-foot uh, alert height, the 75, 76, and 777. And uh, those are all um, 600 RVR. Now, uh, Category 3B, the airplanes uh, here that I have listed on our table, uh, the, the Airbus 319, 320, and A330s, and the 747, uh, they can go down to 300 uh, RVR uh, with a 100-foot alert height and a 50-foot alert height for, again, the 7576777 uh, with the 300 RVR. Wow. I'm just listening to myself just spout out all these numbers, and I'm confused. But basically, I think that answers your question, Derek. You get the picture. Um, it's possible that um, uh, the, 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 the weather is dynamically changing or the airplanes that are getting in are airplanes that have the lower visibility minimums and have the more sophisticated systems. And he said, finally, what is your view and experience in these approaches? And he apologized for his long-winded question. Well, my long-winded answer is more long-winded. <laughs> um, I have been in, I think, once or twice on the TriStar, a real Category 3B uh, landing where we did not see anything uh, at all until uh, the nose was lowered on our landing roll and only until we got slowed down significantly and then all of a sudden we could see some uh, center line lighting, uh, which is very, very eerie when you you know you're about to touch down, but you can't see anything. Um and then I've done Category 3A approaches on the Mad Dog a couple of times, just a handful of times. And uh, it's very it's very nerve-wracking, let me just say that. Uh, because, uh, you're, you know, you're, your hands are on the control yoke and the, and the throttles. And you're basically kind of flying through or following through on what the autopilot is doing. And uh, on the Mad Dog, we have um, a coupled rudder as well below a certain altitude, all of a sudden you can feel the, the rudder system and the rudder pedals moving, and it will actually uh, put in um, a little bit of a slip to counteract the, or, you know, align the fuselage with the runway for landing, and, uh, and it will actually dip down, you know, put the wing low into the wind and uh, set it up for that kind of a landing, a crosswind landing. Um, it is, uh, it's nerve-wracking, let me just put it that way, because if anything goes wrong, um, at any point, especially when you get really close to the runway, you know, you just have to immediately, immediately um, execute a go around and hope you don't hit the runway during that procedure. And if you do, you continue to uh, do the go around procedure. So it's possible uh, if you execute the approach right above 50 feet above the ground uh, during that uh, go around procedure, you may actually touch down a little bit or bounce on the runway. And, uh, yeah, you don't want to, those really, really, really low visibility approaches are just kind of, I think if you ask most pilots, are kind of nerve wracking. That's the best way to describe it in my experience. Thanks, Derek, for your question regarding category 
three auto lances. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is I believe that this may also play a role in why Southwest sometimes doesn't get in. I don't believe, I think in most cases, I know I'm sounding confused here. In most cases, when your airplane is Category 3A or Category 3B certified, it requires two autopilot systems. So you have one there active and one as a backup. Um, you, But there are exceptions. Uh, some airplanes have head-up displays, HUDs, where they don't have to have um, they don't even have to have the auto autopilot system working. So uh, you can fly, hand fly, a Category 3 instrument landing system approach uh, down to, I believe, 100 feet decision height. In other words, you have to see something at 100 feet. Uh, but um, you have to, uh, you know, you're using this head-up display, so you're looking through this glass and you're seeing all the information that's necessary for uh, flying a safe approach, and and you're also looking through or through that uh, to the through the windscreen, and hopefully see something like landing lights, approach lights, something as you get closer to the runway, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, that's one of the reasons why sometimes they have to divert because the uh, they don't see the required visual reference uh, they need to continue to land. That's just a guess. I don't know. Maybe we have some Southwest pilots listening that can tell us more about the head-up display system and the, whether they're hand-flying them or um, using auto pilots or whatever. Um, it, it, as you can see, it gets pretty, uh, pretty confusing. Again, thank you both Chris and Derek for your feedback. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's listen to somebody else talk. Here's Dan. Hi, Captain Jeff. This is Daniel from Fort Worth, Texas. I wanted to say, uh, the more I listen to your podcast, uh, the more and more jealous I become of uh, professional pilots like yourself. It it really sounds like a fantastic job to me. Um, you know, right when I finished high school, I wanted to be a professional pilot. I I went out and got my private pilot's license, but then, you know, I let my dad and others kind of talk me out of it just because the starting pay is so low for a long time, and you know, there's not a lot of job stability there. So instead, I became an aircraft engineer, and I've really enjoyed my career there. I've been, you know, directly de involved in the design of the, the F-35, the Boeing 787, and uh, most recently the Airbus A350, among other projects I've worked on. Um, my question was: um, At age 31, I found out that I have multiple sclerosis, and uh, glaucoma and you know with treatment and medication and everything I'm totally back to normal I feel fine but I found out that I couldn't renew even my uh, my third class medical certificate with those medications and uh, diagnoses that I have so I'm guessing if I had become an airline pilot you know getting a, a first class medical certificate would be out of the question now and to a pilot in that situation um, could the airline maybe find a new role for you, like in a desk job kind of thing? Uh, would you, do you have like a disability insurance policy through ACME or through uh, your pilot's union that you could collect on? Or would you kind of be out on your own to start a new career? I um, wonder if you maybe knew some other pilot who dealt with a situation like that. And just going a little more in depth, I was wondering would the airline or anyone else treat different ailments differently? You know, there's some, sometimes maybe a pilot doesn't take care of their health. They could end up with, you know, overweight, diabetes, or high blood pressure, that sort of thing. But then there's other diseases that kind of just hit you out of nowhere. Uh, and I just wonder if those are treated any differently from each other. Uh, thanks. I love your podcast, and I hope you'll keep doing it for a long time. Well, thank you, Daniel, for your pilot health question. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't. As far as the last part of your question is concerned, are those things treated any differently? Not really. Um, you know, if anything, disqualifies you for uh, from obtaining 
a first class medical uh, certification, uh, regardless of whether it's something relatively minor like diabetes. And I'm not sure if that would actually preclude you from getting a first class medical. Uh, maybe it depends on the, uh, the level um, uh, of diabetes that you, uh, that you have. Or if you, you know, had some kind of much serious, more serious diagnosis or disease or whatever. Um, but uh, you said, are are you able to like get another job within the company? Well, it it's not a guarantee. I, I do know that there have been people who were not actively flying the line because of uh, medical issues, and they ended up working in the training department or some other. Um, department in the airline. Uh, but that's one of those things where the person has to go and actively, you know, find uh, employment uh, and to stay with the company that they're with. Uh, but it's not, it's definitely not a guarantee. And it's something that uh, the company is just not going to offer, you know, just because they feel bad for you. So, um, so what does happen? Well, basically, you go on sick leave. And then once that is exhausted, then you end up going into uh, temporary um, disability status, which is essentially about 50% of your normal pay. And then I think it depends on what kind of disability that you have, whether or not it uh, you run out of your temporary disability and that's it, or you continue to receive long-term disability. And I'm, I'm not sure how long that long-term disability lasts, to be honest. I, I should know that. I don't. Uh, but um, again, that's about 50% of your wage is wages. Uh, we also have something at ACME called the uh, Pilots um, Mutual Aid, um, which is funded. Uh, it's a it's a separate thing from the company, and it's funded separately. And uh, it does provide some additional uh, money and benefits um, to kind of help with the fact uh, that you're losing income. There, you can buy disability insurance. Uh, from either the union, uh, ALPA, or through a private company. And it's not cheap, and especially the older you get, the more expensive it gets. And that can be something that is just like a lump sum, or it could be a, a certain term for, let's say, two to five years. Uh, but usually it doesn't last much longer than that, as far as I know. Um, so there are several ways that you can kind of um, insure yourself from... Uh, a catastrophic event like losing your license uh, due to uh, a medical issue or something else. Perhaps you have gone out there and you're really screwed up and your air, your um, airline transport certificate is pulled. And uh, if that happens, of course, you're not able to make any money flying airplanes, at least for that airline. And uh, so uh, in that case, your loss of license insurance would would kick in. Again, that's something that's not automatically provided to us. That's something we'd have to uh, procure on our own. And, uh, of course, the other option here is, um, you know, if you can't hold the certificate and you can't fly for a living, then um, you might have to go and find an, another, excuse me, find another job doing something else that doesn't involve flying or at least doesn't involve a class of medical certificate certification um, for that particular job. That makes sense? Okay. So good questions. And, um, thank you for listening, Daniel. I'm glad you enjoy the show and I enjoy hearing your feedback and your questions. Okay. Kathy writes, um, I discovered your podcast only recently and have been, uh, have a lot of catching up to do. I had no dear, uh, no idea there was so much to say about aviation news, and I'm enthralled with everything I'm learning, to the point that I'm listening to live ATC channel, KVNY, while I'm on my laptop. However, my husband does look at me sideways at times as he passes through the kitchen. Many times I have no idea what control and pilot are saying, but I'm catching on slowly the more I listen. I have no aspirations to become a pilot, but I love learning all the new things you bring to light. I enjoy your viewpoint and comments, insights, and information. There is the danger, however, that with such information as increased traffic, less training, and more auto flight being used, I will only hope that my pilot and first officer are up on things the next time we fly commercially. This coming 
from someone who flew non-rev. Um, Kathy's son worked for American Airlines at Los Angeles International at the time. From Dulles to LAX and back again before and during 9-11. We were stranded in DFW for three days after that awful event when flying from the east to the west coast on September 10th, 2001. Uh, thank you for such a great podcast. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, a loyal follower in Southern California. And she says, next time you're broadcasting from West Coast Studio 2, we'd love to meet you. Well, I'd love to meet you too, Kathy. Thanks for your kind comments and feedback. And let's move on with uh, Ken. Great show. I always listen to you on my way to work. I've been flying the Microsoft Flight Simulator for some time now and joined some virtual airlines flying online. I know you're not into this, but I guess you'll be surprised how realistic it can be. My question is, since I'm flying mostly virtual airlines hosted in the U.S., they usually base the flights on Zulu time so I can have a realistic time of flight. I'm living in Singapore and would like to ask you how to tell the actual time for me here in Singapore based on the Zulu time I was given for my flight. Uh, thanks very much. And he says, I know you don't fly internationally now, but for if for some reason you ever pass by Singapore, let me know and I'll be delighted to bring you to some places here with good Asian food and coffee. Well, I would absolutely love that, Ken. And let me do a quick check here. Um, let's see. Time in Singapore. And uh, see what kind of... Uh, conversion it is okay right now it's 1251 i'm looking for the um the offset usually it'll give me the offset of course it's not showing me now what that offset is um basically where you are your time zone oh here we go standard time plus 0800 utc okay so the way you figure out your local time in Singapore, because you're, uh, because most everything in flying is referenced to Zulu time, which is uh, coordinated universal time, although that's abbreviated UTC. I don't know why. Shouldn't it be CUT, not UTC? So anyway, it's coordinated universal time, also known as Zulu time or Greenwich Mean Time. I think they all mean the same thing. And so when we use the standard time system, uh, you have to kind of add or subtract a certain number of hours to determine your local time or wh what that would be at your local time. So for me, uh, in the eastern United States, uh, eastern time zone, the, uh, the time offset is minus 5. So right now, and it's interesting that I'm talking about that right now because Many of you may pick up on this. Right now, it is 10, 10 minutes to midnight, Eastern Standard Time. But at 2 o'clock in the morning, it'll magically be 1 o'clock in the morning. Or at 3 o'clock, it'll be 2 o'clock. In other words, we're going to lose one hour tonight because we're jumping uh, from Eastern Standard Time to Eastern Daylight Time. And that's Daylight Saving Time, not Daylight Savings time. That's one of my pet peeves, along with potable. It's potable, not potable. It's, it's daylight saving time, not daylight savings time, because you're saving daylight. You're not savings daylight, you're saving daylight. Sorry, uh, sometimes I get a little, uh, little off track there. Okay, so right now at this moment, it is 11.54 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. So if I add five hours, that would be 1254, 154, 254, 354, 454 Zulu time right now. Okay. Uh, and then as I mentioned, uh, if I were doing the show uh, tomorrow, I would um, add four hours to my local time to get the Zulu time. Or going from Zulu to Eastern time, I would subtract four. So it depends on you know, whether your country or your state um, practices uh, the uh, daylight saving time system or not. 
So for you, based on this website I'm looking at right now, uh, it says that in Singapore, the local time is eight hours ahead of Zulu time. So that means you would subtract, let's see, so if you're given Zulu time, just eight, add eight hours to it, and that's your local time. So as I mentioned, Zulu time right now is 4.55 uh, a.m., so add eight hours to that, and that gives you 12.55 p.m. right now in Singapore. Does that make sense? So that's your offset. So whatever Zulu time is, you add eight hours to it, and that's your local time. So if it's 12 noon Zulu time, add eight hours to it, and then, of course, you're at 8 o'clock p.m. in Singapore. So there you go. Pretty easy, right? Probably one of the easiest, easy, easiest, easiest ways to determine your time is if you have one of these smartphones. I mean, everybody has one, right? Um, I'm using the uh, Apple uh, World, the Apple system, uh, the iOS, and I have a handy-dandy little application here that shows me it's called World Clock, and I can see here that uh, right now it is 11.56 in Atlanta, and in or the universal coordinated time. Did I mess it up? Oh, it's actually 5.56 right now. So, um, does that... Hmm. I'm getting confused now. So if it were actually five hours ahead, 557 plus eight would be 1357. Hmm. Well, something's not jiving here. Let me, uh, I'm showing 157 in Singapore, which is eight hours ahead. Well, you get the drip. <laughs> Just uh, figure out what the offset is. And uh, again, this website I'm looking at says standard time plus eight hours will give you your local time in Singapore. I better stop talking because I think I'm getting myself in trouble and uh, many of you are probably, probably yelling at me right now. So uh, sorry about that, Ken. Um, yeah, just, uh, just do a search for Singapore time versus Zulu or UTC. Okay, Garen writes... <laughs> Hi, Captain Jeff. I was so pleased to find your podcast and website. I've loved aviation and airplanes for some time. I'm afraid I missed my chance to become a pilot, although I did jump from a de Havilland beaver once. On purpose? So it is real a real joy to listen to the show. Thanks, Gary. Well, you're welcome, Gary. Thanks for listening. Um, uh, this is from uh, Fred, who um, I met at the meetup that we had a few weeks ago in Orlando. He says, thanks again for the hosting of the meetup. And if you ever come to the San Francisco Bay Area, please do come flying with us. And then he has a couple uh, websites and uh, some uh, Flickr picture sites and videos on YouTube. I'll put all those in the show notes so you can check out the great flying that uh, Fred does. And he says, by the way, I did pass my A-S-E-S -S checkride, and um, I don't know what each letter stands for there in the A-S-E-S, -S, but it's his seaplane rating. That's cool. Congratulations, uh, Fred, for that. Uh, Chuck writes, uh, my son turned me on to your podcast about six months ago. I really enjoy your podcast. You see, we both are aviation buffs, but my son actually went to school and is building his hours for the airlines. I remain a cyber pilot wannabe. I do spend a lot of time in planes, though, as a passenger traveling about 30 weeks a year. Wow. I find your podcast packed with information and find it entertaining. Be a, being a fellow content producer, I want to thank you for all the hard work you put in each and every show. And that's Chuck Bowser. The Tips for Safety podcast. And let's go over here and look at Tips for Safety podcast, which is tifps.org. 
the Institute for Personal Safety. And, uh, oh, very nice site. Okay, so we're talking about personal safety, cyber safety, general safety. Uh, it was founded, the Institute for Personal Safety was founded in 2012, initially to meet the growing need for quality firearms training. There seemed to be a plethora of people with the only intent of making a buck to provide a cattle call or cattle call type courses chasing that buck. Okay, so I guess there are um, a bunch of courses that you can take by going to this website uh, for various types of safety. Again, personal, cyber, and general safety offer classes from internet security, bullying, travel safety, firearms training, and many more. So check out um, the site, the Institute for Personal Safety, and that is uh, Chuck Bowser's site. Very cool. Um, and, he, and he says something here about a podcast. Here, I didn't see that on the... Um, oh, here it is. On the right, it says the Institute for Personal Safety Podcast. And let's uh, listen to a little bit of episode six. Can we listen to it? Here we go. Cool music. Yeah. Welcome to Tips for Safety. This is going to be another week of information to help make your day a little safer, help you become a little bit more self-reliant, and how to handle, operate, and store your firearms safely while protecting your Second Amendment rights. This week was an exciting week for us here at the Institute for Personal Safety. First, our podcast was added to the Stitcher Radio Network, so you can now listen to us on Stitcher Radio. Awesome. So now we are available on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. And of course, you can still go by our website to the podcast page and listen to them directly. And I also sometimes like put doing. them in the Facebook feed as well. Please stop by and subscribe. And please, please, please leave a comment, especially if you enjoy the show. All right. So uh, there's a little um, taste of the Tips for Safety podcast. So um, thank you, Chuck, for sending in the feedback to the Airline Pilot Guy podcast. Greetings from Hong Kong. My name is Jeff. No, my name is Jeff. No, his name is Jeff. Uh, he's twenty-three, a 23-year-old physics graduate from Hong Kong. I've recently started listening to your podcast, and I have to say I absolutely love them. They give me the insights of being a commercial pilot and your attitude of, if I'm in doubt, fly the airplane manually is something I greatly admire. I'm now working as a load controller. You know, the ones who send you the load sheets with all the vital information like the zero fuel weight, takeoff weight, stab trim, passenger figures, etc. I'm also an aspiring commercial pilot and am currently studying aviation basics. I've downloaded documents from the FAA, such as the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, and I'm seeing a lot of physics-related stuff like torque, barometric pressure, etc., which is great because with that background knowledge, I can more easily understand the concepts of flying. Like yourself and anyone else working in aviation, our top priority is always safety. Our work is to control where the baggage and cargo ULDs, unit load devices, are to be placed while following strict locking and dangerous goods segregation rules so that the aircraft may be able to take off and land safely. Normally, that isn't hard to achieve, except for long-haul flights where the takeoff weight would reach something like 350 tons, sometimes even a difference of 50 kilograms between the forward and aft hold would cause out trimming, in which case we would have to reload some of the baggage and thereby delaying the airplane. Have you encountered a similar situation? When the ramp staff tells you that the aircraft is out of trim and that it must be reloaded, does ACME load con do ACME load controllers uplink the load sheets to the aircraft via ACARS, or do they use the good old traditional method of taking the paper up to the cockpit to get your signature? You know what, Jeff? Uh, we don't see load sheets. What we see is the weight data record, uh, the weight and balance data, uh, the information about the uh, 
the center of gravity, uh, setting our stabilizer trim, uh, setting you know the flap settings, the takeoff speeds, that kind of thing, power settings. But we don't actually see the load sheet itself. Now we do. We are given the passenger figures, the passenger counts, the number of first class, number of um, a coach or economy seats, um, jump seats, whether they be uh, cockpit jump seats or cabin jump seats, that kind of stuff. But we don't actually see the actual calculations that you guys, uh, you know, do. Uh, but yes, I have encountered situations where. Um, you think you're about ready to go, and then all of a sudden you look up and you notice that all of your cargo doors are open, and then you get the, uh, hopefully you'll get the communication from somebody on the ground, uh, the lead, saying, hey, sorry, we have we just got word from load planning that we have to redistribute some of the load because of the center of gravity or you know envelope. Or uh, sometimes they'll say, yeah, we just got word that we have to throw a bunch of sandbags up in the, um, in the forward cargo compartment because uh, we're out of the envelope. So uh, I've encountered it a few times. Generally, they're pretty good at uh, knowing about what kind of load they're going to have and plan accordingly so they don't have that last minute shuffling to do. But because it's always very frustrating because you have to explain to your passengers kind of a, a concept that is hard for some people to understand. Uh, and I I try to, you know, explain it, you know, that the, the whole uh, loading of the airplane is critical and that we have to stay within a certain envelope or certain limits. And as we fly, fuel is burned and that's going to affect the um, center of gravity of the airplane because, you know, the fuel isn't all in one place. It's spread out in the wings and various places in the fuselage sometimes. And uh, when it burns, uh, that shifts your center of gravity. And when your center of gravity uh, and center of lift are too far out of whack, then that's a dangerous situation. So uh, interesting, Jeff. Thank you for your feedback about um, uh, loading and um, interest in physics and such. I do appreciate it. And for some reason, I have a feeling that I've already read that feedback. <laughs> I don't know why, but... Uh, I'm having a, a deja vu moment. Uh, this is from John. I've become a big fan of your podcast. Thank you for taking a, the time out of your schedule to keep us informed of the workings of the airline industry. It truly must be a labor of love. It is. <laughs> it is, John. I mean, honestly, right now I'd rather be watching Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live with my two oldest children. Uh, occasionally I'll hear them laughing upstairs, but... That's okay. I can always watch it on rerun. It's more important to get this show finished. Um, let's see. John continues. I've always been fascinated by air travel since I was a kid. Hearing your podcast, I have stoked a fire for planes in the airline industry that I did not realize was present. If I had to do it over again, I may have chosen a different profession. I get the feeling that it is not reasonable at the age of 42 as I have a loving family to support and a good career in the medical profession. So if becoming a pilot is not a possibility, as by the time I reach seniority, I might, I'm guessing uh, it would be too late, I can't help but think there may be another job in the airline industry that would be equally satisfying. This brings me to my questions. Is there a way to go to, say, an ACME and be able to get an up-close feel for what it would be like to be a pilot or other professional with a major legacy air carrier? Uh, and or is there a recruiter from a school that could give me an overview of the entire workings of getting a plane from point A to B and other professionals that work in the industry? Please feel free to use my question on air, but if you have a chance to respond to my email and writing, I would forever be grateful. Okay, John. Oh, I guess I didn't do that. Sorry. Actually, I think I, I marked your email uh, as something that I should um, return um, or, or reply to, and I haven't yet. Sorry, John. Uh, he sent this to me on the 27th of February, which was about a week and a half ago. Not too bad. I'm, I'm not quite, you know, I'm not too far behind. Uh, so is there a way, um, not that I know of, I mean, uh, to like ride the jump seat or whatever to kind of get an idea what the 
uh, job of an airline pilot is like? Um, no, not in this post 9-11 era uh, we live in. Um, you know, to ride the jump seat, you have to be with the FAA or you have to be a fellow uh, pilot, uh, airline pilot, or a dispatcher. Um, let's see. Other than watching videos and reading books, uh, I'm not really sure what I could recommend for getting a, a really, really good feel of uh, what it's like, you know, to um, do this job day in and day out. I've uh, mentioned a few times Captain Ox. Um, he works for another airline, does videos. Check out his uh, his uh, YouTube channel. Um he does a really nice job of uh, doing videos. There, there are several, several guys out there doing fantastic work, uh, doing videos and um, other content productions uh, regarding our job. Um, let's see. Second part: Is there a way to say? Let's see. Is there a recruiter from a school that give me an overview of the or workings? I don't know. Hey, help me out, folks. Uh, listening to the show, um, help John. Help me answer John's question. Um, again, let me restate it. Is there a way to go to an airline and get a close-up feel of what it'd be like to be a pilot or another professional within a major legacy air carrier? Or is there a, there a recruiter from a school that could give me an overview of the entire workings of getting a plane from point A to point B and other professionals that work in the industry? Um, help me out uh, with, with helping John uh, with this question, okay? So, John... Um, Hopefully we'll hear something. I don't. I can't think of anything right off hand that uh, will specifically address that. So, but I'll work on it. Okay, I promise. Um, my name is McCall Vollum, and I work for a global managing consulting firm. Oh wait a minute. Um. Oh, McCall, I need to uh, contact you about this. Sorry, that's kind of a private email that I did not mean to read on the show. So forget you heard anything there. Okay. Um, from Tim. Uh, hello, sir. Hope you and your family are doing well. I'm currently reading the book Final Approach, which is about the Northwest Airlines captain that was arrested and spent some time in prison for operating his 727 after a night of hard drinking with his crew. In the book, the captain talks about his flight engineer and how incompetent he was. <laughs> He goes on to tell of all the important tasks that needed to be done by the flight engineer before, during, and after the flight. My question to you is, how difficult was the job when you yourself were a second officer on a 727? And how much of that stuff that used to be performed by a flight engineer is totally automated on an MD-88? Are you still required to balance fuel between tanks to keep the plane trimmed correctly, etc.? I thought about you as I was reading the book and wondered if you ever had to put up with a flight engineer or co-pilot that left you wondering how the, how in the heck they ever got the job in the first place. <laughs> also, do you have an, any old pics you could post on your website of a young Captain Jeff with some of the planes you flew in your Air Force days, the C-141, T-37, or T-38? I bet the T-38 was a blast to fly. Take care and have a great weekend, Tim. Yes, it was... All those airplanes are a blast to fly, but especially the T-38. And, you know, sadly, I don't I don't think I do have any pictures of me um, flying the 141 or the 37 or 30. I just didn't think at the time to have pictures made of me in front of these airplanes or in the cockpit of these airplanes, uh, which is sad because I really do wish that I had some of those. Something tells me they're out there somewhere. I just don't know how to get them. Um, I did um, look at a, an old yearbook from Auburn University when, uh, when I was a member of Ada Mu Sigma, uh, Ada Mu Sigma, um, an aviation honorary. Maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll throw that pic in the show notes if you want to see what I look like in 1970. Would that be about 79, 1980, somewhere in there, uh, with my long hair? <laughs> it was, I look like a hippie uh, in that picture, so I'll put that in the show notes. If you're interested, if you're listening to this, um, you need to head over to AVA, uh, Airline Pilot Guy and uh, look at the episode's show notes and see um, 
the black and white photo of me uh, standing in front of uh, Auburn's uh, King Air at the time. Um, oh, your question about uh, plumbing the 727 flight engineer. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of work, um, especially for a pilot who isn't used to not flying an airplane, but basically flying the systems of an airplane. And um, probably the two hardest things to operate on that airplane were the, as you alluded to, the fuel system, several tanks, and you had to burn certain tanks at certain points and make sure certain pumps were on and certain pumps were off and keep everything all nice and balanced and hope that if you got something out of balance that nobody would notice. <laughs> you could fix it before somebody noticed that you had screwed things up. And just a note, uh, if you ever do screw something up, uh, it's better to let somebody know instead of trying to hide it and hope that they, they didn't see it. Because you know what? Chances are they probably made the same darn mistake as you have just made, and it'll be okay. Um, and the other system that was kind of difficult to operate on that airplane specifically was the uh, air conditioning system, You know, trying to keep all the uh, all the people happy in the back, especially the flight attendants, the walking thermometers. Um, and that airplane was really, really tricky to uh, work the uh, air conditioning uh, system properly to keep everybody from not getting too cold or getting too hot. And uh, I'm trying to remember what that system is called that we uh, basically said, don't ever touch it, because um, it used a kind of a weird system of routing air to a certain section of the airplane. And if you, if you messed with it, uh, chances are you'd never get the thing back in order. Um, darn, I can't remember the name of that system. But uh, I'd say the air conditioning and the fuel systems were the, were the hardest to manage. And then, of course, when engines came online, you had to do the, uh, you had to bring the generators online and you had to get them in parallel and you had to Look at the sequenced um, flashing lights. I'm just remembering all these things all of a sudden. And when they were like flashing just right or they were both on at the same time, that's when you flip the switch to uh, get a nice transfer of power. It was a lot of work. It really was. Um, so your question is, the Mad Dog, um, you know, have, have many of these systems been automated? Heck yeah. Uh, the pressurization, air conditioning, still kind of a little tricky on the Mad Dog. Um, uh, but you have automatic controllers that uh, basically do a pretty decent job, and you can also take over manual control of the mix valves. Um, let's see, the fuel system basically takes care of itself. Um, you do monitor it, and occasionally you might have to um, rebalance the uh, left wing and right wing tanks. Uh, if they get too far out of whack, you have to uh, uh, do a little bit of uh, of uh, cross-feeding to make sure that they balance out. But that's kind of a, not, you don't do that very often. Uh, it, for the most part, takes pretty good care of your fuel. Um, let's see, what else? The, uh, the fuel system, hydraulic system, air conditioning, pressurization controller does a pretty good job. Um, that's all automated. And uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff that we used to do manually uh, in front of the flight engineer's panel has been uh, automated to the extent that uh, it's not a not a hassle anymore. And uh, the two pilots can take care of most everything. Now, I will tell you that I still think that a three-pilot cockpit is safer than a two-pilot cockpit, uh, especially when things start going wrong. When you have an emergency, it's much better, in my opinion, to have three brains uh, in the cockpit, six eyeballs, and, you know, searching for traffic and helping, you know, keep things on track. Um, communications, a big bonus when you have another person in the cockpit to help with communicating with flight attendants, uh, communicating with your company, etc. Uh, so in a two-pilot cockpit, when you're having an abnormal or emergency uh, situation, things can get very, very busy very quickly. And um, properly managing your resources in the in the cockpit, you know, cockpit resource management, is very important when 
the uh, the stuff hits the fan, if you know what I mean. So great question, Tim. Um, and uh, let me know when you finish the book, Final Approach, how it is. And uh, uh, yeah, interesting story. Okay, how are we doing on the time? Gosh, another hour. This thing's probably somewhere between two and a half and three hours now. So let me just do a quick look through here and see if there is something that I want to talk about before we wrap up the show. Um, I still have a lot of good audio feedback to play. I'm looking through here. Wow, I have a heck. Darn, I have so much darn feedback. People, stop sending me feedback, okay? Um, just quickly, um, Mike Cochran, one of the fellows that I met uh, in Orlando at the meetup, he's the uh, uh, police helicopter pilot um, or law enforcement pilot down in Florida. Uh, he said, I hope this message finds you well. Here's an interesting story. We've all heard of bird strikes, but fish strikes? And he has a link here, and uh, this is from the USA Today. A jet departing from a Florida military base had to abort its takeoff because of a fish strike. Officials from the MacDill Air Force Base near Tampa tell the Tampa Tribune a Gulfstream G-4 being flown by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration hit a 9-inch sheep's head fish in the incident. Uh, quoting from the lieutenant commander, uh, one of the pilots operating the flight says, we were nearing the point in the takeoff where we needed to rotate or rose, raise the nose of the airplane off the ground when an osprey with something in its claws flew in front of our aircraft. Uh, and then I guess the bird basically dropped the object that it had in its claws. They thought they had hit the bird uh, but when they did a, a post-flight investigation, they couldn't find any remains of the bird, that, but they only found a sheep's head fish, uh, which the Tribune describes as a silvery fish with black stripes on its sides. Base officials sent the fish and DNA from the aircraft to the Smithsonian Feather Identification Laboratory, <laughs> the SFIL, I guess, for analysis. It concluded that the jet did, in fact, strike a fish. This was the first fish strike we had on base. So, interesting story. And it's not the first time, by the way, a, an airplane has hit a fish. Uh, it Let's see, there was an Alaska Airlines flight in 1987 that suffered a mid-air collision with a fish and had to be inspected for damage. They found a greasy spot with some scales, but no damage. Uh, the uh, says Paul Bowers, the then manager of the Juneau Airport, is quoted as saying in the story. So, and presumably only coincidentally dated April 1st, 1987. So, interesting. Thanks, Mike, for sending me the fish strike report from MacDill Air Force Base uh, just south of Tampa, Florida. And, yeah, you know what? Let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. Oh, I do want to mention one thing that um, I'm sure that I'll talk about on the next episode when I find out more information about it. But apparently last night or sometime yesterday, a Malaysian Airlines 777 disappeared from radar somewhere over the Gulf of Thailand, I believe, somewhere between Malaysia. And they were heading, in, heading to, I think, somewhere in China, but uh, somewhere... Um, midway in the flight, somewhere near Vietnam or south of Vietnam in the Gulf of Thailand or something like that, um, the airplane went down. And uh, that's the only information I have at this point. Uh, the airplane went missing, and they presume it crashed, and all aboard perished. So um, uh, that's a, a sad event. Uh, don't know if it's uh, related to terrorism or a bombing or... Uh, what caused the airplane to break up, if that did indeed break up, or what happened in this incident. So hopefully we'll have some more information about this uh, by the time I record the next episode, 108, next week. I leave on a trip on Tuesday, Tuesday through Friday. Right now I'm planning on recording episode 108 on Tuesday. And I hope that the rest of your weekend is a wonderful one. Remember, you can 
Uh, find my show on airlinepilotguy.com. You can find me on iTunes. Thanks to all of you who have left reviews on iTunes. I do appreciate that. Um, you can find me on Stitcher Radio. You can find me on TuneIn Radio. Um, YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, Airline Pilot Guy. You can find all this information by going over to my website, airlinepilotguy.com. Uh, feedback. Many, many ways, unfortunately, to send me feedback. You can leave comments on my YouTube channel, although I don't always get a chance to read all of those, sorry, uh, and answer them. Uh, if you really want to reply from me, the number one way to do it is to send feedback to feedback at airlinepilotguy.com, and that gets into my feedback system. The best. That's the best way to do it. Uh, you can send feedback by uh, calling the... Uh, airline pilot guy voice feedback line, which is area code three zero four nine nine seven four five six eight, or nine nine pilot. Uh, you can use SpeakPipe. Go to the airline pilot guy website and click on the thing that says contact me. There's a form that you can fill out, and that auto also goes to my feedback at airline pilot guy. So I do see a lot all those. Uh, you can also use SpeakPipe. Another great way to ensure that I'll see your feedback or answer your question. And, uh, wow. And then, of course, uh, my favorite is uh, those of you who use your smartphones, your tablet devices, whatever, to record your voice uh, so you don't always have to listen to mine. And uh, then they attach that by sending it to feedback at airlinepilotguy.com. So there you go. Uh, what else do I want to say? Um, oh, I need to mention, um, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the show, um, the uh, sponsor of the show, which is Audible. Uh, you can sign up for your free audiobook trial by going to audio, audibletrial.com slash airline pilot guy. And uh, that gives you a 30 day trial membership and one free book for you to keep whether you continue your membership or not uh, you can cancel your membership within that 30 days and will not be charged a cent and again you get to keep the whatever book it is that you downloaded and somebody sent me um, a suggestion for an audible book here yes Scott Shields sent an audible book recommendation he says, a good book is Catch Me If You Can. It was written by Frank W. Abagnale, 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 and read by Barrett Whitener. It is an autobiography, autobiography written by a former con artist. The way that it relates to aviation is that while he was going around passing bad checks, one of the occupations he impersonates is a Pan Am pilot. And, of course, we all know that after the book was written, there was a movie made, uh, which starred, um, uh, what's the guy's name? Oh, shoot. <laughs> I can tell I'm tired. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was the main character uh, that uh, in the movie, um, Catch Me If You Can. And uh, so check out that book. Uh, use that for your free audiobook download that is yours to keep by going over to audibletrial.com slash airline pilot guy. Also, a reminder, if you want to uh, get one of the uh, flight gear bags that I use, and by the way, more and more people are making uh, comments about that. Uh, they see me with my Brightline bag, my flight gear bag attached to my rollerboard, and uh, they say, well, where'd you get that? And I uh, tell them that if they order the bag and use the promo code airline pilot guy they'll get 10% off I'm, I'm assuming that that code still works and uh, so if you uh, if you want one of these really really cool bags head over to brightlinebags.com and again use the code airline pilot guy when you check out that gives you 10% off and what else I think that's about it so until next time Wishing you clear skies, unlimited visibility, and tailwinds. Take care and God bless.
good day.